16,000 properties or about 90, 19% of our domestic properties are flatted properties. Um, of this, 40% of these um, reside within our housing estate locations. We have 40 separate developments that are managed by 17 separate housing association or managing agents, um, which are um, detailed in respect to this service. Um, the, the main two are the Clarion Housing Group, with, which represents about 52% of these properties. And the second at around 13 and a half percent is the moat housing properties. Um, in terms of service provision, um, we introduced the service in 2018 where every household in the borough was, um, uh, was received a wheel bin waste collection service. The flat properties were um, with the communal collections in the larger containers, um, didn't have a substantive change in the service that they received. Um, operational challenges that we have with the estates um, are uh, most notably where we have estates with mixed um, housing types, where we have housing of um, that receives curbside collections. Those are namely terrace housing and semi-detached housing, um, which are mixed in within flatted properties. Uh, an example of this is the Eastfields estate. Um, these tend to generate our, our service difficulties, whereas we have, um, we have non-uniform collection methods at this location where the where the domestic properties receive a, a every other week collection of their waste and uh, the, the larger communal 1100 liter euro bins receive a weekly collection. Um, it's become common practice for uh, some of the waste materials um, it, from the wheel bin collections to, to transfer over to the communal collections when there's um, excess waste and um, it has also led to fly tipping in these locations. The challenges that we face um, tend to lend themselves due to lack of space to segregate waste, poorly designed or located um, communal bin stores in these locations, and a lack of understanding by residents on um, what and where to recycle using the facilities that are provided by the council. Um, uh, lack of uh, individual responsibility for managing waste in communal areas, um, poorly managed shared facilities that um, tend to encourage antisocial behavior such as fly tipping. And, um, and looking at the incentivizing the segregation of, of waste by having improved and enhanced recycling um, sites is, is limited when they are often uh, contaminated with waste materials. Um, having limited access to bin stores, um, and this could be legacy items from the past designs and builds of, of older style housing can impact on the proper uh, modern waste management at these locations. And the mismatch of the service delivered at these locations, and, and that's what we try to address by assessing the, the type and type of containers need and the frequency of collection. So, so in order for us to proceed, we've taken on some work by uh, task and finish groups with specific housing associations. At this time, it's namely clearing housing and moat housing, working at specific locations. And we're looking at improving this through engagement of residents associations and this has yielded benefits in the, the collection services at these locations. Um, and a good example is the work that we've done with moat housing, where we're in the process of finalizing some revised, um, a revised planning application for the installation of new bin storage um, facilities that will address the Polar Till estate. Um, also, we're, we're proceeding with, with work in developing the collection services at Eastfield's estate. It has taken some time, but we are starting to see some headway in respect to that. Um, it is our aspiration within the service um, to, to go further from this once we have these task and finish 
groups um, resolve where we want to establish a quarterly um, liaison group with uh, our managing agents and housing associations to to keep abreast of the the challenges that they encounter and how we can work together to improve uh, the regular delivery of service in those areas. Thank you very much, Chair. No, thank you very much, John, and it's a very comprehensive update and it's good to hear. Um, I've got a, 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 a just a, a point to make on it, but I think uh, Councillor Butler and then uh, Councillor Holden may have um, uh, just a, a line or two to say on that. Ben, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you, John, for your work in this. Um, I just wanted to check, um, especially from, well, overall, but also especially from my ward of Abbey Ward with the High Path Estate um, and with working with Clarion there, um, you're right in terms of estates having, you know, maybe the design of the streets and the, the way they're laid out. Um, they seem to suffer with uh, fly tipping more than other streets. Is, is that, um, firstly, is that a correct um, assessment from my part? Uh, but also, is there um, a kind of concerted effort to, to build what might be, a, you know, quite a simple um, campaign of, of anti fly tipping, showing what it clearly is fly tipping and what's not? and um, working with Clarion to sign posts around their estates about that. Um, and also in terms of the actual bin stores themselves, you said another example where you um, are going to update the bin stores elsewhere, but in the high path, um, it seems that the actual bins themselves are, are quite old. I mean, I've, I've talked to Clarion about this themselves, but have you had conversations with the quality of especially high path um, bin stores? Um, and is there a, other than the uh, fix and test group, that you want to be set up well there is one already um but in terms of you your conversations with them what's next in terms of helping to sort that problem um that is actually causing pests and um other unpleasant things for the, the community there Thank and I, cheers but just before you answer that john just want to take down in if there's anything and then we'll if you wouldn't mind responding and then we'll get back onto the um, amended agenda dan Yes, uh, thank you. I think Councillor Butler has covered all the various points in one very big go there, all the main issues around bin stock and supply and quality and the frequency of emptying and ease of access. Uh, I think it's all been covered, so, so yeah, not for further to add. John, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if I address the fly tipping issue first, uh, uh, I I, I would say that there are hotspot locations amongst our the amongst our communities where we do have a prevalence of, of fly tipping. It it isn't solely isolated to housing locations. However, it due to the the uh, the amount of traffic at those locations and and often a lot of dead ends and in areas where people car um, park their cars and. Uh, we often have um, different um, service providers operating in the area, um, some uh, where they can take liberties in terms of, of uh, you know, dumping the materials out of their van or, or expelling waste. Yeah, it does have its potential to, to um, have its challenges in terms of fly tipping. Um, it, it isn't just solely concentrated on housing estates. So there are several areas where we do have examples where are probably more prevalent than those locations. And, and, and to a certain degree, the housing associations um, such as Clarion or Moat do take a proactive approach in managing some of their own land in terms of the removal of the fly tipping, where my focus is on council owned land. Um, and, and so our, our numbers may, may differ slightly. Um, in, in respect to a fly tipping campaign, that's something that we're actively um, that we're actively pursuing through our fly tipping action plan. That is something that came as a, um, to the to the um, to this panel, um, you know, last year in terms of the fly tipping um, strategy, and, and and that is our our vehicle of implementing change in, in that area. And that's something we're going to revitalize in the spring of this year. So. That's something we definitely can and pursue and 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 advance. This and it would be good to work with housing associations in those locations, um, and also the residents associations, low um, as part of that as well to to broaden the, the communication channels as much as possible. 
Um, in, in terms of waste containers and the quality of the waste containers, and then subsequently the, the, the waste storage areas, those are, those are often, if not solely, the responsibility of the housing association and the residents themselves. Um, through the housing association to to provide those containers. So, if if they want to improve the quality of those containers, we will work with them to make sure that they have the best containers. We can we can facilitate that through Veolia, through either Ben Rental, or or even the purchase of new containers. Um, often they are the last thing people consider amongst uh, refreshing in the property is, is the waste container itself, but it's something that does have a limited useful life and um, they do need to be refreshed. And that's something that we're focusing um, on in our task and finish groups is the quality of that container. In terms of the service frequency, that's something we control as part of the service, the, the amount of times that we visit that um, container, the, the larger, Ford wheeled 1100 liter Euro containers, they receive a weekly collection, whereas the normal residential properties that have that have the, the space and capacity to have a, a, a wheel bin container in the, in the recycling box service will receive a every other week service at that level. No, thank you very much, John. It was really good to hear the, the great work that, and the stakeholder engagement you've done on that as well. And also the, the, the interest in the progress that's been made with particularly Moat um, in, that, in the, the position they've got with actually securing a site and the planning application as well. I think we've, given the opportunity we've got next time round uh, with Clarion presenting, I think we'll probably, if, Rose, if we, if we could add on the um, action list um, to take it away and see if we can... Uh, well, we'd definitely probably want an item on this since there's an opportunity to have them there and talk about this because it, it it ties quite nicely into uh, Regen as well and and the actions up to uh, uh, Regen and it may be worth having Moat there as well as a mirror to see the um, you know what what was good and, and sort of their next steps. Cool, but there, thank you very much, John. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you. So, Back on the amend agenda. So we're taking item seven, so it's HGVs. Uh, Paul, would you mind giving us an introduction, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, members and the community who are making representations tonight. Um, the report provides members with um, a bit of an overview, really, as to some of the challenges we experience as a highway authority in managing HGVs um, and reflecting on some of the complaints and issues which we often receive <clears throat> as a council. Uh, the report starts off with the, the road hierarchy or the road classification across Merton. And I think it's important to show that because how vehicles get around the borough and how they travel through the borough is largely determined by <clears throat> what we'd expect to see in certain roads. So obviously Merton doesn't have any motorways, but we do have some, a number of A roads and B roads, where that's where we tend to, we call them main roads, but you that's where you tend to find through traffic or where motorists would get across or through the borough. Uh, and equally how we'd expect HGVs to traverse the borough. Um, HGVs in Merton can be servicing businesses in industrial estates. They can sometimes be servicing residential properties, which I think we see, we've all seen an increase of during lockdown. Um, and of course, some travel through the borough. So there's quite a lot of uh, variables in there to manage. And we try our best to keep HGVs on the main roads where they should be. However, uh, technology does pre present a challenge. As we all know, there's increasing evidence that SatNav tends to direct inappropriate traffic into residential areas where it really shouldn't be. Uh, and that's that's a constant battle we face <clears throat> as a highway authority, where we'd ra rather keep residential roads for residents and the main roads for through traffic. Um, <clears throat> so with that, there are, there are a range of measures which the council can engage in, but we are quite limited as well uh, in, in what we can do to uh, arrest uh, the issues that HGVs cause. Uh, we accept that there's a need for them uh, in many cases in supporting businesses and supporting the borough. Uh, but equally, you know, there's many streets where it's not appropriate for them to be in. So we can introduce lorry bans. Uh, we have done that in many streets. Um, some of that is enforced by London councils uh, on the main road network. Uh, but in Merton, we also have some local lorry bans where we advise HGVs and motorists, uh, drivers not to go there. <clears throat> 
that has had some success over the years. Uh, but as I mentioned, I think it, SatNav is creating a bit more of an issue where at the click of a button, drivers are advised to cut through neighbourhoods to shave two minutes off a journey, uh, regardless of what the, the character and nature of that street is. Uh, and also with HGVs, we are very much aware of it's the noise and vibration that tends to uh, concern residents most. Skip lorries tend to be the worst for that. Um, and again, noise and vibration can be affected by traffic calming measures. So as a council, we always have that balance around trying to make sure the streets are safe, uh, but recognising some traffic calming measures like speed humps do cause noise and vibration. And we tend not to try and put them on the main principal road network for that reason. <clears throat> Across Merton, there's also certain neighbourhoods which are more susceptible to that noise and vibration than others. Uh, certainly neighbourhoods where there's older housing stock, uh, where the houses might be closer to the pavement or where they get sash windows. Uh, you do tend to get more noise and vibration associated there uh, for that reason. Uh, the report also covers off um, where we do have opportunities to enforce. Uh, we can use CCTV cameras. Automatic number plate recognition is, is growing. Uh, Merton is increasing its stock of those, and that is another way where we can monitor and therefore enforce um, inappropriate um, patterns of driving. And I suppose more recently, and it will, it will come up in a report later tonight, uh, low traffic neighbourhoods is another way of the council being able to actively manage and control traffic and specifically HGVs in residential areas, uh, whereby you can actually limit the through traffic in certain neighbourhoods. Um, doesn't mean to say you'll never see an HGV there. Uh, certainly there's homes still have deliveries, people still have house extensions built, uh, some skips are still needed. But um, the, the point here is trying to reduce road danger where we can influence it, and that's largely through, to, through traffic. So with a range of physical measures and parking enforcement as well, um, we, we can try as best we can to mitigate the negative impacts of HGVs across the borough. <clears throat> With regard to speeding, we also work with the local police. Um, speeding is a criminal activity, so it's one for the police to enforce, not, not necessarily the council. Uh, but we have engaged with local communities as well on speed watch activities with the police. And there's work underway at London Council's level to see if that that um, if the enforcement of speeding can be transferred from the Met Police to local authorities. So that's something that's underway. It has been for a while, but that's underway at the moment. So something we're very interested in monitoring. Uh, <clears throat> conscious that it's, um, it's, it's a lot of report, we could talk about it all night, but I'm very conscious that uh, there's residents here wishing to make their concerns noted as well. So I think I'm, I'll pause there and I'll be happy to take any questions uh, from members and the community. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, what we'll probably do is hear from our uh, residents associations first, and I'll, I'll go through the order in a second, and then open up to the panel for um, any questions back to the residents associations and obviously yourself, and um, then general questions or comments before uh, moving into uh, item six. Um, so can we have in this order, so we've got uh, Nicola Thompson from the Havens Road uh, North Community Group, uh, then um, can we get Peter West from the Wimbledon Park Resident Association? And then we'll, we'll last but not least, uh, we've got Susan uh, Kuzak and, uh, from the Belvedere State Resident Association and Lynn Gordon, Chair of Wera, together at the end. So if we start off with uh, Nicola, uh, you've got two minutes, Nicola. Um, please feedback um, the, the, from your residents on, the, on this item. Thank you. Hello, Nicola Thompson, Haydens Road, Road North Community Group here. HGVs are integral to our economy, so are residents. It's the council's job to balance our needs and safety. I have three suggestions. Firstly, the quantity of HGV traffic. Does the council have any idea how many lorries travel on our roads on a daily basis? If you don't count them, and I understand you don't as a matter of course, the council has no idea of the scale of the problem or indeed whether there even is a problem. There is a problem. My first suggestion, therefore, count HGV traffic on key streets on a regular and ongoing basis. Secondly, the behaviour of HGV traffic. Your report says that complaints by residents directly to HGV companies have yielded some success on rack running and speeding. This is correct. Why can't council do similar? Make contact on a regular basis with these businesses, highlight areas of concern and encourage compliance. You may not have powers to fine or prosecute on highways, highways breaches, but you are the customer for many of these companies. They rely on Merton Council for contracts for the renewal of licenses and permits. 
council holds considerable considerable power and influence so here's my second suggestion be proactive provide proper oversight tell these businesses to respect the law respect residents respect the borough and do it regularly thirdly my final point location of industrial processes i live close to plough lane formerly a largely empty space but now densely residential new developments on plough lane and Dernsford road overlook industrial waste recycling centers in weir road serviced six days a week by many thousands of lorries. Why are these pollution generating sites still here, despite the changing nature of our neighborhood? Why is there no long-term plan to relocate them somewhere more appropriate, like beside the A3? This would keep them within the borough and slash the number of trucks on our streets. Protected sites can be moved because that's exactly what's happening at Benedict Wharf. So that's me wrapping up with my third point. Please respect the changing nature of our neighborhoods and, induce, and adjust council industrial planning policy accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola, for your um, three um, suggestions, um, very pointed, thank you. Um, Peter, up next. I'm from uh, Wimbledon Park Resident Association. Those who live in Wimbledon Park or nearby will have noticed large numbers of HGVs carrying waste to and from Weir Road in the Dernsford Road Industrial Estate. These sites were permitted in the 2012 South London Waste Plan, but there have been few checks on their delivery development. For example, no checks on the number of uh, HGVs and no assessment of the pollution they generate. In the new Southwest uh, Plan, the sites in Weir Road were judged favorably for environmental considerations. That's because they didn't lead to air pollution in the nearest air quality focus area, 1.5 km kilometers away in Wimbledon Broadway. Yes, you heard that right. No account was taken of the very high levels of air pollution in the lo roads local to Weir Road. We have surveyed the number of movements of waste carrying HGVs to and from Weir Road. Even during lockdown, there are 650 about every day. That's one a minute. Only one fifth of these are going north, so four fifths are bringing their waste through Wimbledon unnecessarily. The new waste plan, that's the 2021 to 36, assumed that all waste sites were to continue much as they are but it would clearly be beneficial if some of the waste destined for Weir Road was closer, processed closer to where it's generated. We noticed and just been remarked that in Benedict Wharf with 40 plus HGVs, that's actually been done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, finally, um, Susan and Lynn, who are you both contributing or uh, is it? I think I'm, I'm going to speak on behalf of uh, Beera and Weera. Super, go for it. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'm Susan Cusack, Chair of the Belvedere Estate Residents Association, which covers 26 roads and over 500 households in and around Wimbledon Village. And I'm also speaking on behalf of Weera. So we really have a major problem here. The location of the Weir Road Waste Recycling Centre um, is actually the real issue. When the four councils consulted on the draft SLWP in 2019, they agreed they could meet their targets, but only by intensification of waste treatments on all of the 46 sites identified. Merton's local development scheme 2019 to 22, read the SLWP, stated that they would ensure that waste facilities have the least impact on the environment. That's not happening. This is not the case in respect of the numbers of HGVs transiting the borough and Wimbledon Village and its environs in particular. Our ultimate suggestion is that this site be gradually wound down and that waste recycling is relocated to a more industrial location, perhaps off the A3. Meanwhile, enforcement to ensure these HGVs and skip lorries are using the correct routes is necessary. And we agree with point 254 in your report that this duty could be transferred to local authorities to enforce on behalf of the Met Police. With regards to complaints, renoise and speeding, perhaps more people are at home and therefore reporting has increased. However, I've always worked at home and my kitchen faces the road where I have a direct view of three local access roads in both directions. The number of HGVs that turn off St Mary's Road and trundle down and back up Churchill is quite significant. 
despite all the new 7.5 ton um, lorry bans, which are clearly being ignored by many. In order to reduce noise, nuisance and pollution, we would suggest the following. Replacing old diesel vehicle, vehicles with electric ones, fines for companies ignoring the correct route. Obviously, this would require ANPR cameras. All skip lorries to have chain covers, all to keep to 20 miles an hour. Again, enforcement is key. However, there's still an issue. Even if the lorries do choose the correct route, it will bring them down the Village High Street, Church Road, Ridgeway, Wimbledon Town Centre, etc., where there are residential properties. And we're all being encouraged to walk, cycle, dine al fresco. So the pollution needs to be drastically reduced as soon as possible. Otherwise, there'll be more cases like Ella Kissy Deborah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Susan. And thank you all three, um, three four of you for taking the time this evening to, to make representations. Um, so before I come back to any comments from the panel, back to residents, I just want to sum up. So we've heard a lot about uh, the sort of the quantity and quality of traffic and the actual, you know, what surveys are being done. Um, we've, we've heard a lot about um, compliance and, 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 and how that is being done as well. Support for change of powers um, and also about land zoning as well. And um, so do we have any, before Paul comes back on that, do we have any additional comments from the, the panel on, on that particularly, David? Uh, yeah, I was, I was keen to, um, quite a lot of the chat was about waste management. And although um, it's going to be very hard for officers to give us the answers at the moment, because um, I doubt they count them, but do they sort of segment the types of HGVs that go through the borough? And are there any in particular that are issues was my particular question and point. Good follow up question. Anyone else before we go to Paul? Dan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to all, everybody who contributed. Um, this is a major issue affecting Hillside, Wimbledon Park and Village, and I'm very well aware of all the emails and, and complaints. So I would like to see a uh, response from officers about actually taking more of a practice stance. And when we get around to putting some recommendations down, I, I hope they will receive them favourably. Cool. And um, Anthony, and then I've got a point to come back on. Thank you, Chair. I... I think I, my comment at this stage, I, I just wanted officers to reflect on is this, this report is very much about uh, the measures that can be taken to you know, reduce the problems caused by HGVs, whereas the residents have very strongly spoken about the need to reduce the numbers of HGVs. And so um, I appreciate that this report isn't angled the right way, but I, I think that's something for the, the council to reflect on. Um, there was also a reference in uh, what Nicola said to, to the council's soft power um, in terms of influencing the behaviour of HGV companies. And I think paragraph 2.512 uh, rather suggests the council doesn't feel it's got any soft power. That's in re relation to TfL, but it, it's very much saying, you know, this, this problem isn't ours. Uh, it's better when residents complain directly, not us. Um, and there's also the stuff about the, uh, the London Council's powers in 2.3.1, uh, um, which again puts, puts the problem back on somebody else. I mean, I, this is the first I'd ever heard of the London Lorry Control Scheme. I wonder how residents are sort of supposed to know about it. So some of this might be about gathering information together. But I, I'd maybe like some reflection on both the kind of how, how we can reduce the number of HGVs and also... Um, the reasoning behind why why we don't think the council has the soft power, or is it just a lack of you know, available available resource? Um, no, thank you, Anthony. I mean, my my point is actually to follow up on that um, to slightly argue the the reverse. Actually, in some respects, um, in the sense that the numbers, of course, are concerning in the sense of, um, uh, you know, if, if you see any number of HGVs, but it's actually the emissions and using our soft power and contracts moving forward, how can we, where possible, um, incentivize providers to either use low emitting or zero emitting vehicles, um, bearing in mind that while the um, domestic market for electric vehicles it is ultimately just starting the, the 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 commercial market needs a bit more maturity but if we can have that sort of foresight um then you know so my question back would be what's the art of the possible um paul oh sorry uh, we'll go back to paul and then nick will start you off as round two okay thank you um 
not sure if I wrote these down in any particular order, so please jump in if I've not addressed any points. Uh, one of the first points mentioned was really the number of HGVs on the road and do we have that data? Um, Nicola Thompson was right, we don't have that data, we don't monitor that or collect that. <clears throat> I'm not aware of any particular limit or you know, number of HGVs that should be on the roads. Uh, it'll be different for every borough, different for every city. Um, if they paid road tax, they're allowed to be on, on, on the roads. Um, for us as a highway authority, and I'm very conscious here that the discussion here is, spans a number of policy areas for the council. Uh, we talked about procurement, we talked about air quality, all of that is within the whole council's remit. Uh, but for my team and as a highway authority, the presence of HGVs is an issue when it becomes a safety issue, or a road safety issue, um, because that's where my team can have influence. If there's ways we can improve the road network, make it safer, or if there's evidence of real danger, we can take action such as speed cameras and work with the police and other bodies um, to make the road safer. I'm aware it sounds very counterintuitive to wait for a danger before you mitigate against it, but um, unfortunately that is the nature of how we're funded and how, how we're set up. <clears throat> so for me, my team is a traffic team. It's about making sure the roads are safe. Um, of course, secondary to that is air quality and there's other action plans around that for the council. So we don't yet have traffic counts, but uh, again, if we if we if it's brought to our attention there is a real problem to address, we would have to apply for funding to TfL to create a case to monitor, gather evidence with a view to delivering a certain project that would mitigate that issue. Um, and I think everyone's clear tonight. It's it's weird roads. Uh, in terms of waste, um, every house in London generates waste. Um, some construction sites do as well. Um, so that is the London plan and South London Waste Plan, that's all got to be dealt with locally. Uh, for us, that's South West London as a whole. Um, and I know the example of Benedict Wharf was given there. And you know it's a fair point. It would be lovely to be able to relocate uses to better suited locations. Uh, that isn't always within the council's gift because you're talking about private companies who own their own land. It's third party land. I think with um, Benedict Wharf, the example there was the immediate road network around that couldn't take any more growth in HGV, certainly Church Road and Mitchell Cricket Green. And there have been previous examples of trying to get planning permission for more waste use on that site that didn't happen. So I think the landowner there knew they wanted to move and worked collaboratively with the council to come up with a different plan for that site. And that went through the waste plan and the local plan process. So again, a lot of, some of the topics raised here are relevant to raise here because it's HGVs, but actually they're relevant to the local plan. Uh, and perhaps London plan as well. So I can't offer a full answer to any of that, but I, th I would just say it is not easy to move third party land or businesses all over the place without identifying where you could prove it, who would fund it. So I think Benedict Wharf uh, is a good benefit to move that to, to Bennington, but I don't think we can feasibly as a council move things around that much. Of course, the local plan and the South West London Waste Plan is the way to maybe achieve some of that, but you're talking decades to achieve that strategy if that, if that happened. Uh, in terms of replacing vehicles as well, um, yes, I'm sure, sure over time businesses will start getting more eco-friendly. Council, through its contracts, could specify that when those contracts are up for renewal. Uh, again, that's slightly outside my remit, but certainly something that cuts across all council departments. Um, so, uh, someone said, do we segment HGVs? Not that I'm aware of. Um, there's different types of HGVs. It could be bin lorries, um, skip lorries, um, supermarket delivery, Amazon depot, wh whatever. Um, so without the traffic counts, no, we don't actually specify what type of HGV it is or, or why it's there. Uh, I'll pause there. Um, have I missed any key points that are mentioned by the residents up till now before we make council questions so going back to the, the points i've noted so we've got the frequency and number um we've, the emissions produced we've got enforcement um and i think i mean for me it was actually susan's point and uh nicola's about um and maybe we can actually tackle this in the next round as well in the actual enforcement of any hgvs who are breaking yeah. Um, particular road weight limits and, and things like that. But Nick, I promise you, first dibs, second round. Yes, thank you, Chair. It's a very simple question. There's a, uh, a lot of mention made of moving uh, 
uh, industrial and, and particularly waste things towards closer to the A3. I just wanted to know how much space within the borough, other than residential, retail or protected green space, is available next to the A3? Uh, simple question, really. Thanks. Good question. Um, anyone else before we close this and move on to the next subject? Uh, go on, one from Anthony and then back to Paul for final comment. Sorry, I, I just didn't want to miss the opportunity to have my kind of question uh, responded to. So I'd asked about the council's reluctance to sort of exercise the soft power. So like 2.5.12, uh, where, where the sort of pushback was definitely to residents to kind of complain about these things. And that was something that came up in, in Nicola's um, comments. Of course. Paul. Yeah, happy to see them. Um, one of the first comments was um, enforcing the number of HGVs for a specific business. I understand it might be the DVLA or um, some agency that can actually dictate a certain business, say waste, can have a specific number of HGVs and it's part of their operation. I can't go into specifics of any schemes, but I, I anticipate what is behind this question is there may be certain sites in Merton with planning permission. That planning permission may have a planning condition that limits number of HGVs or number of HGVs permitted to operate from that site. If that is the case, then yes, I would advise residents and councillors to A, let us know. Um, we can, if, if, if it is a planning condition issue, then we can raise that through planning enforcement and talk to their businesses directly. Only if there is a condition that we can work from, we need a legal framework to raise these types of issues. But if we can help, we will do that through planning enforcement. <clears throat> it does it, that. That links back to the Anthony's question around, you know, is there a reluctance to enforce or encourage or get involved in this? I wouldn't say it's a reluctance. It's definitely a capacity issue. Um, our team are responsible for, for lots of parts of Merton, whether that be the road, the traffic, the cycling, planning. Um, it's literally down to capacity and our ability to be able to engage on a one-to-one -one dialogue with you know, potentially tens, hundreds of businesses quite regularly on how they're operating. And again, if there isn't that legal structure for us to go in hard, if you like, and, and threaten enforcement, then it really is just about encouragement and regular dialogue. Um, I, th I think, you know, looking at the people on, on the call today, we, we could probably think of five companies locally who are probably the top five that we need to engage with. We do that on occasion, but um, I, I would say, I, I don't really have a legal basis to say to HGVs, no, you shouldn't be here without the evidence. And what has been very helpful, you know, again, with social media, we get lots more videos, lots more photos of where there's clear infringements. That does, have, that does give us a certain bit of evidence to open a conversation with certain companies. I think, um, what about, sorry, um, Paul, about particular, I mean, you, you kind of answered it a bit, but in, in an instance where we've heard that there's, you know, a picture or a clear breach of going down a particular road because of the weight and the size limit, what, how would you advise residents approach that? What would be helpful to us is if, if you see, certainly if you, if you know you live in the lorry ban area and you see HGVs that you don't think should be there, I wouldn't immediately think just because there's one HGV there's a problem. Quite often it could be residential properties, a lot of properties in Merton are having house extensions and loft extensions. They will require skips and things. So don't immediately assume that one HGV in your street is, is a problem. If you begin to notice a pattern or a specific company who keeps doing it, if you've got um, photos of that company, the lorry, their logo, ideally the registration number, then we can raise that with HGV companies. <clears throat> the other thing with HGVs, and it relates back to the speeding point, is all HGVs are fitted with tackle graphs. So it, it logs where the drivers are, it logs what their speed is. So we could, again, if we had strong enough evidence and reason to ask companies to justify, you know, shows your evidence on, on, on SatNav, where have your lorries been? D this certain lorry keeps driving down this street, they should stop that. So I think to help us help residents, having a body of evidence would help. And certain neighbours have done that. It's quite obvious on Twitter that there's a lot of evidence already. I think that's that's very helpful, Paul. Um, so if I just, uh, in summary, before we move on to the next item, um, it's, it's it's clear that um, you know HGVs are you know a vital part of our economy, but we know that in some areas of our borough um, they they may be going down routes that they're not supposed to, or there's there's general concern about numbers and or general concern about the the emissions produced. Um, the council has some powers available. It's asked for others. 
uh, particularly in terms of speed and form um, from London, uh, from the Met Police and, and we're working with London councils on that. And um, you've outlined, Paul, quite helpfully, um, some of the actions residents can take. I think we'll, we'll probably want to uh, revisit this in the recommendations um, and may actually, moving forward, have, because this is such a large subject and no recommendation is going to, um, you know, is going to do it justice, revisit um, the use of roads or, or, or the, the HVs maybe as a particular subject as well um, in the next uh, round of, of business that this panel looks at. Um, but yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, residents, for coming. Uh, Dan, sorry, have you got oh, a point? Sorry to butt in. Uh, is it worth uh, putting down some recommendations now for officers to start thinking about rather than just notes and reports? Because it would be good to put down some steer of what we'd like the council to do rather than just saying thank you for doing the report, off you go. Well, I think what I would like to do is revisit the recommendations for this item at the end. But I, I think if you've got your pen ready, uh, do write them down. I mean, I've, I've noted several ideas myself um, and it'll be helpful if you would just circulate that to me via email or the, or the chat. And then we could um, we can sort that out at the end and confirm those. Um, but thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much to our th uh, four speakers from resident associations. I really, really appreciate you giving up some of your time this evening to talk to us. And hopefully you've gone away um, with, you know, with some positive information and we can take this forward. Thank you very much. So we're going to move now on to our next item. So that's item six. So that's uh, roadworks and utilities. Um, Chris and Paul, would you mind introducing this item? I'll hand over to uh, Paul to introduce this item. Thanks. Yep. So thank you. I was working across two laptops there. Yeah. Um, so the, the report on roadworks and network coordination. It's it's the first time this topic's ever been to scrutiny that I'm aware of. So by its nature, it's quite a detailed report, which recognises the, the kind of complexity and breadth of what the highways team deal with. And I've got two colleagues from highways on here as well who will be able to respond to questions later. Um, the highway network is the council's biggest asset and it requires constant monitoring and investment. We manage over 71,000 individual assets on the road and that does not include street lighting lamp columns. Uh, so that's all your road signs, street name plates, bollards, everything. Um, <clears throat> And we also, in the report, we've also said the kind of the length of the network we've got. Just to put that in context, if you laid all the borough's roads, footways, and cycleways end to end, they would stretch from Morton to Shetland or Morton to Berlin. That is how big the highway asset is. So, <clears throat> no mean feat to keep it running and keep it safe. So, the report really covers off how we assess and manage repairs to the highway, uh, and that's reactive repairs. So, that's where we investigate proactively and spot things to fix, and equally where residents and councils report to us things to fix. It also covers off the, the planned maintenance, so Merton Council invests capital every year, and we completely renew footways and carriageways where they're most in need. Uh, there's the network coordination function, and that really is the highway permitting team, where we um, assess and approve permits to allow utility companies, developers to dig up the roads, put it back when they're finished with it. Um, also emergency work to keep utilities running and make sure that the residents have you know, gas, electricity and broadband when they need it. Uh, we also have a highway inspection regime. So we do walk the borough uh, and assess all the roads and pavements. And we also assist with many major events in the borough, obviously not this year thanks to COVID, but usually uh, there's things like Wimbledon Tennis, um, Ride London, Eastern Electrics, Armed Forces Day, you know, a lot of parades and anything that happens on the highway, we coordinate um, and try to mitigate issues so that we can ensure that the highway runs smoothly and people are safe. So the, the report also provides, I, I won't go through it in detail, but um, the report also provides a statement as to the condition of Merton's road network, because uh, quite often people are, are concerned or interested in how Merton's network is performing. So section 2.36 of the report, you can see a, a graph which shows that there has been a sustained improvement in Merton's footway and carriageway since 2011. That graph shows the amount of roads and footway that is defective. So as the graph goes down, it means less road is defective or footway. 
Um, so on that graph at 2.36, the red and yellow lines show footway and carriageway um, getting better in Merton. The pink and blue lines at the bottom, you'll see that's beginning to go up again. That is the council's principal road network, so A and B roads, the main roads across the borough. And the reason for that uptick is TFL, as, as part of their savings, stopped investing in the principal road network in 2019. So we're beginning to see a bit of deterioration on the main roads. It is still within our tolerance. Our borough target is that no more than 25% of the roads should be defective. We're currently around 19%, so we're, we're within our own target, uh, but certainly watching the main roads uh, because it looks like they're getting worse because of lack of investment at TFL level. 2.37 shows a graph of the borough. Every year we get radar surveys done of, of all the streets in the borough. That, that looks at not only the condition of the road you can see, but what's under the road, because that's, when that begins to fail, that, that costs us more money. So you'll see the map there. Most of the borough is quite happily green. There's some amber. That means we don't have to invest in that street yet. And there's some red bits which show up as they're the priorities for the next four years investment. <clears throat> so we often provide a four-year rolling program. Sorry. A four-year rolling program of footway and carriageway resurfacing. We usually fix that program in March for the year ahead. It does fluctuate, uh, quite often weather dependent. If we get snow and ice, that can make some roads deteriorate worse than others. So we often keep an eye on, on the road condition. Um, members can also see uh, 2.38. We've actually mapped the, the amount of jobs and repairs that we undertake across the borough, and you can see that broken down by ward. Uh, you can see that the road resurfacing is pretty even across the wards, footway a bit less so. <clears throat> and some of that is down to the fact that some parts of the borough footways are busier, deteriorate more than others, uh, but we're keeping on top of that. In terms of network coordination, we engage with developers, engage with planning uh, on proposals, uh, and our job really is to make sure that not only is the highway safe, but the number of people who need to work on the highway um, either we coordinate it and let people do it at the same time to minimise impact, or we we plan ahead with utility companies. So quite often we do have um, a forward programme for utility roadworks in the borough. That hasn't happened this year. Uh, when lockdown happened, a lot of the utility companies stopped their proactive maintenance and reverted to a situation where they would only respond to emergency um, situations. So in effect, we've lost that, that ability to forward program as well until those forward programs come back. So quite rightly, us as a highway authority and residents, when you see roadworks and wonder why that happened last minute, it's because actually we found out about it last minute as well. <clears throat> and usually it's, it's um, emergency. So hopefully we get back to normality next year, where we're able to forward plan three months ahead with all the utility companies and see where the planned investment is. Uh, so we, we hope that will get back to normal shortly. Uh, finally, um, the report concludes with um, information on the number of permits, inspections we carry out, the number of permits we give out. You will see that there's an increased number of inspections this year compared to any other year previously. And that is down to a an internal restructure in the team where we've actually merged permit and inspections together, but given people smaller areas to look after. So we've got more eyes on the street. Um, so the inspection regime is showing that we're getting through much more inspections than we normally would. That is also helped by the fact that the changes to COVID means there's a bit less planned work with the utility companies to, to monitor and inspect. So we've been using that downtime to actually inspect more of the borough where we can. Uh, and finally, there's a bit about the permitting income. I've lost my six. It's about a million pound a year, roughly, is, is what we bring in. So that's what we charge utility companies to come in, do works on our road, repair the roads. Uh, and we also monitor that, check the effectiveness of what's been reinstated. And we do take a lot of enforcement to get bits reinstated as well. I think I'll pause there and leave it to questions from members, if that's OK. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Paul. It's very comprehensive. I mean, for me, it's really interesting in this area, the particular growth in, in sort of the, the smart solutions and technology to use as, as, you, as you've outlined. Um, so I think we've got a question from David. Um, who else? We have two more hands, Anthony and Nick. So David first. Yeah, I think the key thing that uh, residents will tell you, and I'm pretty sure it's not a qualitative judgment, is that uh, roadworks, you typically find nobody working there. And uh, that can, I know when I've spoken to officers, they've said, look, they asked for three weeks. They give us reasons they need three weeks. 
Uh, and if they go over those three weeks, then we fine them. But I don't think this council should be accepting three weeks. I've spoken to other councils and uh, it really is about management. It's about pushing back to them. So I'd like to ask the council officers if they ever push back and do they believe that in an eight hour period, somebody should be working the majority, not the minority of time? So fair question. Um, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the uh, roads and pavements, the vast majority of queries I get from residents about this usually relate to the lack of information that they have about how Merton approaches this and what def defects it's going to uh, repair and, and how quickly it's going to do resurfaces and things like that. So I wondered if there was uh, any more information that could be provided for residents on, on this. Um, I was also slightly surprised to see the sort of lack, sort of slight lack of correlation between the actual proactive road resurfacing and pavement repairs and the reactive stuff, which is on page 128, 129. So village gets a lot of the uh, proactive stuff, but isn't by any stretch of imagination the, the focus of the reactive repairs. Uh, and then on the network coordination team, um, this year obviously they're doing a lot more inspections and I wondered what, what is the difference on the ground of those increased inspections? And secondly, the network coordination with regard to developments, that's, that's particularly controversial uh, in my ward with the example of Graham Road. And I wondered what opportunities there are for residents to, to input into that process, um, please. It's a fair question too. Uh, and Nick, finally for this round. Yeah, very simple. I just wanted to find out why TfL have stopped investing. Uh, did it have anything to do with a, a deal struck with, between the previous mayor and the then government? So it's another good question. So we've got um, three broad areas, obviously, um, with David's in terms of how do we enforce the actual, um, well, that the works are happening in the speediest way possible. Um, Anthony's about correlation and engagement and information. And again, Nick's on the financial element um, and, and the and sort of TfL side of things. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll take Nick Draper's question first because I didn't get rid of until then last time. Um, I, I don't wish to comment on the politics of what was behind why TfL made savings. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it was in 2019 TfL had to make savings and they chose to cut the borough, uh, all boroughs, uh, strategic road funding. We have been able to bid to TfL to get some of that money back where we demonstrated that some roads absolutely needed it. Uh, so we've got some money back, but I think it's about 200 odd thousand we've lost annually on that to put a figure on that. <clears throat> um, Councillor Fairclough's question around why Village looks to get more proactive work than the rest. Some of that is um, all the graphs and charts are shown as per meter. So per meter of roadway change. We did do a big job up in Wimbledon Village uh, Parkside uh, last year with the whole road group resurface. Now, with that being a long road, it made the stats look like we'd done much more in Village, but it, it was one road, not, not 100 roads. Um, in terms of um, what notice we can give to residents, that is different depending on what the job is uh, and the task in hand. You'll see from there, we, we get through about 4,000 permits a year uh, for various reasons, and it wouldn't be possible to consult everybody on everything, it, it would just choke up the system. What we do is we, with the planned utility works, for example, we do plan ahead with them. We put notices on the website. We do a weekly road work bulletin to councillors and residents uh, who are interested in that. And if there's planned utility works, planned for a street, we would put newsletters out to residents in advance to say that that was happening. Or we would ask the utility companies to do their comms engagement as well. For major work such as Kingston Road and South Wimbledon Junction last year, we did have SGN and their comms team who put up a dedicated website and they dealt with a lot of the, the comms. So if it's a big job, you would expect more consultation. If it's Thames Water doing a connection to one house, we generally wouldn't consult people or notify, we just let them do it. So it depends on the scale. I suppose that's quite similar to the point you mentioned around development sites. Again, you know, if someone's getting a house extension, some, they might need a, a utility connection. We generally wouldn't inform residents that that's happening. We just trust that that happens in a couple of days and it's done. Uh, as we know from Graham Road, there's there's many schemes where they, they would require or may require part of the highway uh, to enable that construction. 
that process is not all managed by highways, but it's in close collaboration with the developer and planning. <clears throat> so I'll talk about that process then, what we can do to engage in residents. When things go, go come up for planning permission, um, planning committee would decide whether the principle of that development is sound. And then once the development is agreed or got planning permission, that's when a lot of the detailed work actually happens. So it wouldn't, it would be rare that an applicant would know their construction management or logistics plan at the point of planning application committee, because quite often once they get permission, they then commission that work, but it would come back to the council as a planning condition. So when that comes back as a planning condition, the council planners and the highway team get together, talk about the pros and cons of the approach and it either gets signed off or it's challenged and, <clears throat> and revised. So that is the process there. What happens is that when a development is about to happen on site, the highway team would have to give it a permit to allow the developers to go on and do those works. What we would do is there'd be notices on the street to say this is happening. We would normally put, put that in the road work bulletin as a say a closure or a park road closure. Uh, and we would often put newsletters around the residents to inform them that is happening. Um, so it's very much a case of we inform residents rather than consult and engage. There may well be schemes where there might be multiple options for how we might treat the highway. If, if we felt there was multiple options or if we felt it was such a scale that people would want to contribute, we would do a consultation. Uh, but quite often it's notification because quite often a lot of that thought has happened and the decision is there usually is only one way to do it. <clears throat> so really it's a question of scale uh, as to when we in, involve residents in that. Um, in terms of the inspections, um, I'm not, oh sorry, um, Councilor Dean's question was on as a visible activity on the sites. Um, some of that really uh, depends on what's happening. Um, I can understand the reason. I've seen it, you see things coned off and nothing's happening. Nine times out of 10, that's because something has happened in the ground, but the tarmac is still drying and the concrete is still curing and you just have to leave it to say, otherwise potholes happen later. So quite often inactivity means something's been done, but it's, it's settling or drying. It's really not in utility company's interest to take longer than they need to because it costs them money to get the permit to, cl to close the roads. And if they run over time, we find them. So it's really not their interest to take longer than they need either. Um, so I, I, don't, I understand it's a common bugbear of people just seeing cones and nothing happening, but quite often there is a reason behind that. Okay, yeah. so um, why don't we give a, another round? I mean, I've got, um, so we'll, we'll take Dan in a second. I'm sort of chair's prog, so I'm gonna, Two questions actually well kind of three um it'd be really great if you can expand further on some of the the technology and the smart city stuff that you're trying to do in this area um really really interested and and also potentially expand further on some of the financial aspects given that um uh, what you just mentioned but also the impact of covid and finally to the to your last point to, to david's question i think then and be good to get your view back on this david if it's not that constant monitoring, which obviously it would be resource intensive, is that communication that these organizations are fined so that um, it's just a general awareness and, and how, you know, how is that reviewed and how, how is that communication um, assessed and is there a, a plan behind that and, or, or you know, what would be helpful in that area? Um, so those are my sort of points on that. Um, Dan had his hand up. Do we have another hand? Uh, then we've got Mike as well. Can I go now? Go for it. Thank you. Um, one of my main issues with utility works um, in, in particular is the fact that diversion signs are sometimes put in a, in a sort of situation where they divert traffic down residential roads where residents weren't expecting to all of a sudden see HGVs and lorries and, and buses, etc. So when there's major works, for instance, uh, there's one plan for Walker Road. Uh, everybody knows that uh, in that area, they'll just go which way place. And there'll be similar examples dotted around the borough. So it's like, how do we ensure we uh, sort of take the uh, sort of public's voice and uh, factor that into the planning of diversions? And, and then uh, another query is actual council owned works, not utilities. So footways and resurfacing. Sometimes the notification appear to ward councillors might be the day before the council starts. So it would be better uh, in each yearly cycle to have more of a heads up so we can advise people so it's not such a sh sudden shot to us or the public. 
Two very good questions. And uh, Mike. Right. Thank you for um, um, giving the opportunity to ask the question. And thank you for explaining also uh, about the the way that we negotiate or discuss routes to development plots and the like. Um, but I'm just wondering what opportunities there are to recover the costs of repairs uh, and the increased wear and tear to highways. I'm thinking of the High Path Estate um, that's currently underway and what will be going on in the Eastfield Estate at some point in the future in my ward. Um, because there, are, there is inevitably going to be a wear and tear element. The, the, the roads are going to wear out faster. There is damage from heavy vehicles. Occasionally the, the bollards at the corners of, uh, of junctions or the the pavements tip because they go over them or crack the pavements. To what extent can we monitor and recover the cost of repair? I'm not thinking of fining, I'm just saying that just recovering the cost to put it back to rights. Uh, and then after the works are finished, maybe resurfacing the roads that they've been using uh, by agreement, building that cost in or that, um, that element in. I think that's, that's a really great question. So we've got two, I mean, both mine and Dan's question were ultimately about communication to residents, councillors. Um, and then how do we plan in uh, diversion signs accordingly, taking uh, the best approach forward? I'd followed up on smart cities and the economics of it all. And obviously Mike's point about how do we factor in potentially in our own contracts or, or ways of doing things, this additional cost for the, 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 the shift footprint and, and volume of the vehicles, linking back to our previous item. Yep, certainly. Um, it's, in terms of um, engaging members on council plan the works, um, we have in this report attached the the program ahead for the year. It may fluctuate slightly, but you know when we have that, we're happy to share that. Um, if the notification has been a couple of days before, it shouldn't be. It should be longer than that. So I apologise for that if that's happened. <clears throat> but generally, we we're able to um, let members know when planned footway and carriageway works are happening, and newsletters often go out. Um, Council Holden's question around diversions again for planned utility works such as the one mentioned in Whopper Roads. <clears throat> it's that example of where if we felt there was multiple options for doing something we would engage people and think about them further than that would include councils and, and residents. Quite often there isn't always a plan B <clears throat> so the diversions are planned because it's the safest way of dealing with that issue and we know they're temporary changes so they're not often long-term changes at all uh, but they are an, a necessity. Uh, we've got aging infrastructure all around the borough. Uh, we have to let utility companies do the works they need to do to service our residents. It's our job to make sure that they do that as quick as they can, as safely as they can. We understand diversions are annoying and a distraction, but we do try and minimise that where we can. But quite often diversions are are in the only place they can go <clears throat> for very good reason. Um, in terms of fines, um, 2.88 in the report, we've mentioned there about the, the permit income. That table does include uh, defect income. So that's examples of where <clears throat> if a company has not patched up the road properly, we would ask them to go back and fix it again, or they pay us and we go back and fix it. <clears throat> so that 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 defect income is in there. So we we are able to provide members feedback on what we're finding people and what income we're getting. It links, it links back to Councillor Brunt's question as well about what happens when there's major developments like High Path and Eastfields. We can recoup, we can manage uh, the damage to roads in that situation. That will often be, if it's a major development, there'll be a planning obligation. So a planning condition or a section 278 agreement where in effect developers, if they break it, they fix it, uh, is, is the long and short of it. <clears throat> so again, that's where our highway inspectors are out there in the borough looking at development sites, looking to see what impact it's had on our footway and carriageway. And if we spot defects, we through planning and highway agreements, get those fixed. Or quite proactively as well, if we know there's a lot of work happening, say for example, we knew we had a road that needed resurfaced, but we knew a lot of development was happening as well, we would wait till the development was done and then do the road at the end. So that's where we play around with our, our proactive programmes. Um, on smart cities, there's a number of interesting bits of work happening here at the moment. Through the highway contract, which we re-procured, uh, I think two years ago, just over two, Year and a half ago, I think now. <clears throat> um, we know there's certain parts of the borough which are susceptible to flooding, or if not river flooding, it's the, the drains often can't cope in storm events. So we've actually got a programme underway at the moment in Rains Park where we've got sensors in the, the gullies. 
So if you imagine where the drain cover is, under the drain cover, we've got sensors in there. And what that does is it monitors the amount of silt buildup, which means we know in advance whether something's blocked so that we can get our contractors out, jet wash the gullies and pipes proactively to avoid a flood. So rather than waiting for a flood to happen and find out it was because of a blocked drain, we can tell in advance <clears throat> the drain's about to block and we can go and fix that. So that's a trial as part of our smart cities, which we're running in Rains Park um, at the moment. <clears throat> Um, of course, the, the streetlights, um, everyone will have noticed that Merton streetlights are now white LEDs, which is better for us, it's cheaper to run, uh, there's less maintenance because they last longer. Uh, but in terms of emissions, those LED lights now account for 10% of the council's whole carbon emissions. We're currently modelling what that would have been with the old sodium lights. We think it would have been at 30, about 25 or 30%. So there's a huge carbon savings in what we've done with LED lights so far. Um, in highways, there's other smart cities projects that are always on the go. We always keep an eye out for research and where we can innovate and get some of that in the borough we can. Uh, I know Chris Lee, through his work in South London Partnership, is working on a project called Internet of Things, uh, which may throw up other opportunities which we can um, invest in Merton in. So smart cities is definitely something that we are interested in and we can trial and innovate where we can. Did I cover everyone's questions there? I think it did. I think it does. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much. Um, so finally back to Anthony and then we'll wrap up and move on to the next item. Anthony? Sorry, I asked too many questions in one go. Um, I asked about the uh, on the ground effect of the extra inspections that had been carried out during, during COVID. Of course. Yeah, hopefully my colleagues are in the call as well. I'm gonna ask either Gary or Paul Nagel if they can come in on that on specifically on the inspections. Yeah, Paul's there. Thanks. It looks like um, your teams have done some great work um, doing doing some extra, extra inspections. I just wondered what um, you know what the practical benefit to us uh, of of that work was. There were there was nothing in the report about what what that meant on the ground, as it were. Okay. Um, well, we have to do ten uh, percent of each category inspection. Just give you a quick lesson. Category A's are while they're in progress, while someone's digging the highway, making them safe. A category B is six months while they might have done an interim reinstatement, and category C is up to two years on the reinstatement. Every utility works is guaranteed for two years. Um, what we've found is that we've, because we've been concentrating on stuff where it's actually been excavated and people are actually working, and we're sort of working with the gangs, it's given us the opportunity to go and check the historical stuff before it goes out of date and try and catch it in this guarantee period. So we are finding. We are finding some benefit, but we find some stuff that needs to be done and we're getting it done again, which starts the cycle again. Once the, the old reinstatement's failed, we fail it, they go and do it again, and the two-year cycle starts again. So it's just a, it's given us an opportunity to get back on top of the asset, take what we can while we can, while we've got this little window of opportunity. And fingers across the next three years, we should see some benefit. That story very helpful. No, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to pay a uh, particular uh, praise to both uh, Paul and Gary for, the, for their work on this and, and appreciate them joining the call. So um, what I'd like to do is move on to the next item. So that's item eight. But what I suggest we do is, as I said at the end of the last item, is at the end of these th th these three items, before we go into the budget, just discuss recommendations because these three um, items of business are very, very similar in terms of what they, what they deal with. And so that we can have a comprehensive view of them all. I mean, Mike's question before is, is is very you know relevant to that so that is a, that's a perfect example um so thank you very much everyone so if we move on to item eight so sustainable travel paul is that you again yeah she can't get rid of me yeah <laughs> so the sustainable travel item th this covers two parts really the panel got an update in september on the council's active travel plan in response to COVID. <clears throat> and that already covered off the council's programme of low traffic neighbourhoods and school streets. So I'm, I'm not proposing to re repeat all, all of that tonight. <clears throat> the report tonight provides an update on where we're at with the COVID transport measures, where we're at with round two funding, uh, and then a bit about the Transport for London LIP funding, uh, which is where we deliver most of our active travel work from. <clears throat> so over the summer uh, with COVID, uh, the, the council rolled out a number of 
temporary changes to the road network uh, to enable social distancing, uh, to improve cycling opportunities and to limit through traffic to create safer, healthier roads. Um, we received funding from the DFT Emergency Travel Fund and in section 2.9 you'll see the, the temporary measures we undertook uh, across the borough there <clears throat> and they were very much temporary. Uh, in section 2.10 of the report, we've covered off school streets. So as part of that first tranche of funding, the council was very successful uh, in getting money for school streets. We rolled out 25 school streets in Merton. We already had three live before. <clears throat> and I have to say huge thanks to Mitra Debate and, and the traffic team, because it took about nine months to get three school streets in, which is normal. You know, we engage people, we consult, we refine, get TFL to do their, their work and put it in. In the space of four months, we rolled out 25 school streets, so it was no mean feats. Um, <clears throat> quite happy to say, proud to report that actually in the graph in section 2.16, you'll see that Merton had the largest increase in school streets across London. We are now the biggest borough in London for the largest number of schools on school streets. <clears throat> so that, whilst it's a good measure of success, we are not finished yet. Um, the consultations on school streets are still live. We are still we are still accepting comments from residents, uh, from school teachers, head teachers, because we understand these are controversial. A lot of people support them. Uh, they're good for mitigating poor air quality right outside school gates. Uh, they are good for mitigating road danger at school gates, but they have an impact, and we're monitoring what those impacts are. Some some of it could be spill over to neighbouring streets. Um, so those consultations are still live. Uh, so we will report back um, at some point over the next year um, as to whether we intend to keep edits or uh, change the school streets. <clears throat> low traffic neighbourhoods is quite a similar issue. Um, Merton actually had a lot of low traffic neighbourhoods, but they were never called that. Uh, we had lots of streets already in the borough closed off to through traffic, but now the term is low traffic neighbourhoods. So again, we see these as part of the mix in making Merton streets safer and healthier. <clears throat> we do want to minimise through traffic where it's not appropriate, and low traffic neighbourhoods allow us to do that through targeted uh, road closures or roads closed at a certain point. So all streets are still accessible to residents, but they're not accessible for through traffic. So as part of those experiments, we rolled out the first lot of LTNs last year um, in Mitcham and parts of Morton. In December, we were awarded a second tranche of funding from the DFT, and that was Active Travel Fund. Uh, we didn't get any more money for school streets, um, but I think that's good because we can focus on other things. We did get further funding for low traffic neighbourhoods uh, in the Merton Park area, Hayden Park Road, Dundonald, Cottenham Park and South Wimbledon. We are currently, in, we've been engaging members on that. There's still a few meetings with members to go and the newsletters are on the website now um, for residents to view. The benefit of how we're doing it this time compared to last year is last year, because it was the COVID emergency, it was very much get the schemes in, consult later. Uh, this time around, we're engaging people up front, uh, welcoming suggestions and ideas as to how they think the schemes will work. Um, but there's a very tight timeline to get these delivered. Um, with the TFL funding, we've got to get the purchase orders raised by March. So it's quite a rapid engagement, get the schemes designed and put them in. Um, what I would say, though, is to reassure people is because they're still being done by experimental orders, we have the flexibility to change and adapt these schemes once they're in. <clears throat> so whilst we're consulting now, if people support low traffic neighbourhoods, good, please tell us. If you're not convinced that things right, well, still say yes and we'll work through the edits as we get in. It's, it's better to do that than just not have it at all and, and potentially lose that investment in the borough. So the LTNs roll on. <clears throat> Finally, just talking about TFL LIP. Most of the borough, the borough's transport strategy is the local implementation plan, or LIP for short. <clears throat> and basically what that is, is we get an allocation of funding from TFL to deliver the mayor's transport strategy locally. And in the LIP, it's a three-year program <clears throat> of how we look to improve walking, improve cycling, improve road safety. And quite often the range of projects includes things like zebra crossings, um, accessibility at bus stops, accessibility at um, road crossings, uh, as well as cycle training, schools engagement, school travel plans, um, and collaborating with other teams such as air quality <clears throat> and regeneration. Disappointingly, in March 2020, sorry, just as, as COVID happened, um, it's no surprise that TFL's financial situation was perilous, and TF, 
TfL scraps all boroughs' lip allocations in March. So the funding that we normally have ab available to make our roads safer was taken away in March. We did deliver the LTNs and other projects, <clears throat> but what happened is in December, TfL were able to give some boroughs some money back. So again, on top of the LTN program, we've got three months to deliver some lit projects as well. So the stop start nature of the program this year has been very challenging um, and challenging for residents because all of a sudden there's no work, then there's a lot of work uh, to get engaged in at the same time. So under the LIP schemes, I'm not going to list them all here, they are in the report, but you'll see from section 2.36 uh, what we think we're able to deliver between now and April uh, with the TFL funding. A lot of these are not new schemes. It's ones where we plan to do them, but couldn't do them last year, so we brought them forward. Um, a lot of it's accessibility, zebra crossings, uh, pedestrian crossings at, at lights. <clears throat> and some small scale cycle schemes where again we've been engaging uh, residents and the transport group on those. So not a huge program of road safety or sustainable travel this year, but we're doing what we can with the funding available. Finally, um, just in the lip as well, we've got some money now for to continuous training with schools. So we do a lot of cycle safety and cycle training with schools. Obviously that's paused at the moment with lockdown. Um, some of it's gone digital, so we're doing Zoom calls and there's videos, uh, but we do keep that engagement going with schools um, throughout the year. And finally, happy to say that we've got some funding for cycle hangers. So we've got a lot of residents in the borough who want on-street cycle hangers <clears throat> for secure cycle parking. Very much welcome in places where perhaps houses have been converted to flats, the flats don't have cycle stores. Uh, so we've got funding this year to roll out 20 across the boroughs. So they'll be available for residents to use. Uh, so we're in procurement of that now. So we'll hopefully roll out cycle hires from the summer. I'll pause there, but I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. It's a good, positive um, news story to end on, Paul, as well. Yeah. Um, I definitely want to get some of those in my ward. Hint, hint. Um, so uh, we've got probably take a, a round or two questions on this. So we've got Dan hand up. Anyone else? Anthony and Mike, Dan first. Okay, thank you, Paul, for that update. I'm pleased you ended on cycle hangers because I recall on several occasions in the past I've banged on about that in committee and council. So, so I look forward to seeing those, uh, and especially if the council makes good on their promise to uh, pay for the annual fee, uh, if that will be good, and that will really encourage people to actually actually use them. Anyway, that's more of a comment. My question is about. Um, the LIP program and existing cycle routes. You, uh, you keep mentioning examples of new things you want to do, but one of the main things that can make active travel better between locations is the more joining up of uh, existing routes, uh, making them safer um, and, and things like that, and making them accessible. So I'm thinking about things like the route, National Cycle Route 208, uh, that mm -hmm. tries to cross Bushy Road, um, and it does so in a very dangerous way. Um, that's an example that could be improved. You know, Countless sort of examples dotted around the borough. Uh, you could, if you really focus on that, uh, you can actually make a big improvement to active travel. And now I would cycle more in that situation. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, Anthony. Thank you. And I wanted to ask with regards to school streets, uh, what, what the further ambition is, if, if there is any further ambition. I know at the moment we don't have funding, um, but, but representing a Ward where primary schools wanted school streets but but didn't get it this time. Um, wondered if there's a sort of further ambition. And my second question related to low traffic neighbourhoods. It, the paragraph two point two eight talks about engagement with ward councillors. In the email I received before Christmas, the procedure I think set out that that the informal consultations wouldn't proceed if the majority of ward councillors objected. But I wondered if that was still the case or whether. Uh, a different approach was now being taken. Good question. I was actually going to ask myself about next on school streets and uh, Mike. Thank you. Um, my questions are also about school streets and I, one, you may not know the answer, but, but if the contrast between three taking a long time and 25 going quickly, is there a greater um, appetite tight in the community do you think for school streets now is that why that success was there or what what was the learning from it uh, may not have the answer tonight but uh, be just be interested but the other point is about the signage for school streets uh, and there are a lot of signs that have gone up and it's it's a good program it's a safe 
um, program is, is protecting children, but uh, to what extent can we review some of the posts sticking out the ground uh, uh, now with, with the, the, you know, school street signs are often where you're going into a 20 mile an hour zone or there's a reminder of a 20 mile an hour zone. So some of these, can we remove some of the, the posts and just consolidate some uh, because every post is a potential flight tip point? Uh, in my books, so <laughs> I had to get that one in. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'd be interested to know what we can do on rationalising posts. I think that's a good point, Mike, and also it's sort of behavioural change as well. Drivers being confused by too many posts and options. So, so just round up. So we've got um, how we have post um, consolidation and um, obviously early day results from um, the school street so far. Um, Anthony's points on consultation and, and, and working as you know, sort of three councillors in agreement together. Again, what's next on school streets, particularly I'd say those schools which are not in a school street scheme, so to speak. And then um, Dan's point on the lit programme and, and cycling routes and how do we join things up a bit more? So it's not necessarily using money, it's just sort of common sense stuff. How can we join A to B? Yep, um, so I'll, I'll take Dan Holden's point first it's a very fair point you know um there is a cycle network in Merton there's gaps in it it would it would be great to fill them in the transport strategy which is the, the lip three we have identified uh, cycle routes in Merton uh, TFL have identified strategic cycle routes they'd want to invest in and we've identified gaps as well normally what we'd be doing is if we had the full complement of lip funding we'd have a proportion of cycle money and we'd be investing in that network what's happened in the last year is whilst tfl have given us money for school streets and ltns they haven't given us cycle money so without the lip we don't have the money to do that yet so what i would say is that vision is is there in the lip but it's all subject to funding so i think it'll be next financial year when we can look to see what else can we do with the cycle network uh, and invest in that it's disappointing because we put cycling bids into tfl um, TFL identified College with High Street, the route down to Mitcham, the, the route along Kingston Road. We put bids in for all of that, uh, but they just didn't invest in it. <clears throat> so it's disappointing, uh, but I think we all share the same vision that we'd want to join up what's there now and make cycling easier for all. <clears throat> in terms of the school streets in future, um, when it took nine months to do the last one, that, that is quite normal for a traffic scheme because we're often very considered in looking at the options, engaging councillors, engaging residents, and quite often there's two consultations uh, before we get there. I think the lesson with the school streets programme here is we put a lot of bids in for low traffic neighbourhoods uh, and school streets. All of them are off the back of a consultation the council held in May last year, where we asked for suggestions and ideas. Honestly, I don't think we anticipated we would get 25 school streets, so we were lucky <laughs> is one way to put it. Uh, I think the lesson learned is we did put them in rapidly. That was a huge expense of staff time, goodwill, lots of evenings and weekends. I wouldn't propose we keep running <laughs> like that. Uh, and again, you know, these issues rightfully should be consulted with residents. We absorbed feedback early on. The nature of the funding last year didn't allow us to do that. We literally had to put them in and then consult after. So whilst it is a good way of getting action quickly, I don't think it's how our residents expect that we would normally do business. So the lesson learned is I would rather consult first and you know, program it properly rather than scatter on the borough, which is what we've done. However, the benefit is we now have a lot of school streets. I think the lesson learned with it was we didn't anticipate the need for exemptions. So school streets will be monitored with AMPR cameras. The residents in those school streets are rightfully exempt from fines. You know, they're allowed to drive in their own street. Uh, we're trying to mitigate the school run, but not actual residents driving in the roads. So the scale of exemptions is probably something we didn't anticipate, and that's been a lot of com complicated work to work out with Ringo um, and the AMPR supplier. So again, a lesson learned is if we had time, we'd have thought about this first, rather than finding out halfway through the process. <clears throat> um, engagement with ward councillors on LTNs. Um, Anthony, I think you're talking about what we've done previously and what we're doing now. I think certainly um, cabinet members' view was we would like to have consensus and award um, so that we know the council's lined up so that we can all say the same thing about LTNs. And, you know, it's part of our sustainable travel work. And sometimes you've got to nudge people in that direction. Um, it, it's not a car, it's not a stick. You know, it's a way to encourage people to change their behaviours in, in driving. Uh, this time round, because we're able to do the engagement up front, we've written to councillors just at Christmas, 
Uh, those conversations are still ongoing, and certainly we're meeting, I think, tomorrow uh, to talk about Don Donald. So really, it's about what's on the plan is what we put forward as a bit of TFL. Uh, but we do want to hear back from councils about do you think it would work? It might not work. What alternatives could we think about? So it's about making sure that we're we as a council and councillors and officers are kind of on the same page and understand why our scheme is going forward. And, and again, these are trials, so we will. It may never be perfect, but at least we get the opportunity to talk about it. So again, I don't know if Martin well, Councillor Martin Welton wants to comment on whether you know if it's not all supported, it gets dumped. Um, I think that's. I'm, I'm not sure if that is true in this round. Um, Martin, do you wish to come in on that point before I go to the other questions? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in terms of it, obviously we are talking to um, local councillors um, about the schemes, um, but I will say obviously if a majority of residents um, in the affected areas um, are opposed to the scheme, then um, they won't proceed. I think we do need to have um, residential consent um, if um, low traffic neighbourhoods are to be successful. Um, I think they have a huge benefit in terms of the borough. Merton already has one of the highest number um, in London, which have been introduced over the past um, 40 years. And I think there's something, some, I'd actually like to see more of them within the borough, um, but they do need to get that residential um, support going forward. Thanks, Martin. Um, last two questions I've got here was appetite for school streets and then the signage, if that's right. So I think there always was an appetite for school streets, but they were very much seen as a trial. Uh, so we had Singlegate and College Woods, I think links up in um, Mitcham. And they were ones that were very much driven by the school and the parents, and we were able to work with people and develop those schemes. Um, as with any traffic scheme, you'll get supporters and you'll get people against it. Um, but I think quite obviously this year, there's been a lot of attention about air quality issues around schools. Um, I think with lockdown as well, many people have been living more locally. People have had the time to walk their kids to school and not drive. So I think there probably has been a bit of a, mind, a mindset change this year. Um, so the school streets that are still out for consultation, we haven't delved into all the consultation yet because it's still live. So, um, <clears throat> and again, just the capacity of what the team is delivering at the moment, we will assess all those comments at the end of the consultation and make sense as to whether we keep, edit or adapt some of the schemes. Uh, Councillor Brunt, a very fair point on signage and clutter. Um, I've spent years complaining about road signs and clutter, and then lo and behold, in the last six months, I've plastered the borough with about 60 odd signs. Um, so, yes, um, it's because of the pace we worked at. We just had to get all these in quickly um, and at a pace. What I would recommend is when we get to the end of the consultation periods, because these are all experiments, if we look to finalise a scheme, then yes, we rationalise all the cycling because you've got 20 mile an hour, we get CPZ signs, we get school zone signs, lorry band signs perhaps. So I think there is definite scope to rationalise things once we finalise the projects. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Paul. I think that's, that's, that's very comprehensive. Um, I'd like to see if Chris has anything to add on this point and then perhaps ask our cabinet members um, also to comment Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was just going to touch upon TfL, uh, because as Paul's pointing out, a lot of our success and ambition is driven by TfL funding. And whilst we can draw upon parking revenue and sill monies in our own capital, we have for a long time relied on TfL funding. Uh, and it won't be news to members to know that, that their position is perilous. Uh, and on Friday, they published their financial sustainability plan. Uh, and the negotiations with Treasury will continue over the next couple of months in order to secure their uh, financial settlement for next year. Uh, and that was a condition of the bailout that they received this year. Uh, they need, I believe, something in the order of about three billion uh, and uh, another 1.5 billion the following year. And that's to return to the sort of funding that we used to enjoy uh, and the sort of investment in cycling schemes and other necessary projects in the borough. But we may be uh, reaching a, a change in the way that we receive our funding, because just this year uh, we've managed to access funding which hitherto wasn't available to London boroughs, uh, which was available for beyond the borough boundary, but beyond the London boundary. Uh, and we're now seeing the Department for Transport opening up some funding for London boroughs and direct funding coming to us. Uh, and that may presage a, a, a different 
uh, approach to funding uh, London boroughs. And we've seen over the recent years, uh, TfLs move away from direct funding from government and more reliance on its own resources. And that's to be expected and planned for in their financial sustainability plan. Uh, and we expect to see that carry on. We've seen uh, in the draft budget that the precept to London boroughs will increase this year to fund the, uh, the concessionary travel for under 18s and over 60s. Uh, and we wait to see what the Treasury makes of that financial sustainability plan. But I raise it really just to underline the importance of that relationship with TfL in the past and almost certainly for the future, but also the potential that we may start to see now a different relationship between London boroughs and the Department for Transport directly and our ability to access some of those resources uh, over time. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'd like to invite uh, the um, uh, cabinet members to for a second if they've got anything to add on and then I'll take uh, David's point as well. Uh, uh, Councillor Mulley, I can come in quickly. Um, I think I would just commend officers for undertaking really a huge amount of work on um, the active travel projects across the borough, and particularly for such successful bids um, as part of the tranche two funding, which are ultimately um, fundamental to helping us uh, meet both our air quality and climate change objectives. So um, I would just add that. No, Thanks thank you me. very much. Martin? I'd just like to say you know, it's been a huge amount of work to implement so many schemes across the borough in a short period of time. Uh, the number of school streets we have across uh, Merton, uh, 29 um, in total, is, is making a fantastic improvement to the environment outside of schools um, in terms of clean air, air and reducing um, emissions, but also as well to make it an environment to encourage walking and cycling um, outside, of the, outside of them as well. Um, likewise, in terms of the additional um, cycle lanes um, we have um, across the borough, but also as well measures to uh, improve um, accessibility to town centres by having wider footways. Um, we're aware, obviously, of social distancing um, requirements and the low traffic neighbourhoods, which builds on some of the work we have done um, previously. I think LTNs are, are of huge benefit if done um, right, so that's why I think it's important when we do introduce them uh, that we do have um, that um, consultation um, because I think it helps um, immensely. And I have a huge, huge respect for all the work that officers have actually put in, especially uh, Mitra and Paul and um, all the team. Uh, it's not easy to do these measures, um, but you know we have we have put them in place, and obviously we will be closely monitoring them going forward. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Martin. David, and then on to, well, we'll sort of recommendations for these three items. Yes, so I think the uh, what everybody said about school streets is right, but clearly there's a physical objective. Uh, everyone can see a school and the road needs to be uh, as quiet as possible when uh, coming and going. In terms of some of the low traffic neighbourhoods, um, I know all of the councillors on this panel and, and probably all of the councillors at, at Merton have spoken to engineers over the years about uh, traffic flows and what's good and what's bad. And the fundamental challenge I think a lot of councillors have with officers here is that the roads that have been proposed are not the roads that have been the issues. And we've heard officers talk about, uh, you know, we, we try to be democratic. Um, we were promised that councillors uh, would have a big say in this. And uh, we had nine minutes before Christmas in the hope that over the next 20 days we would calm down. I think the key thing is that it would have made much more sense that officers spoke to councillors directly before publishing. Uh, you do have the opportunity to still do that in certain schemes, but clearly these are not rational. Uh, they are not based on a very specific requirement. And the first port of call has to be the councillors that have been discussing these issues with officers for many years. No, thank you very much, David, on that point. Um, so can I draw our attention to, unless Paul, you want to come back on anything at all? Yeah, I, I forgot to answer one of um, Councillor Fair Clough's questions earlier about future school streets. Um, so just to say that clearly the ambition is there. Um, however, at the moment, we are quite 
our hands are tied by the funder we've got. So all the funding for school streets has been delivered. Anything in future years will be dependent on the availability of what's in the lip and, and again, the support from schools. So I think for the moment, we need the space to conclude the programme we've done. Uh, mm. but that does not rule out anything in future. Yeah. I've got a, a, a sneaky suspicion we may have a recommendation on, on the future of school streets uh, coming very shortly. So if I can draw everyone's attention to recommendations on these three items and also thank you all for bearing with me to try to pull that together because they are very sort of similar subjects. Um, so what, why don't we do this? I, I propose, um, why don't we so go back to, bearing in mind what we've heard on these three items, let's, let's go back to HGVs in particular and just, and do we have any recommendations or thoughts on that? What, what are we feeling um, about a point? Does anyone want to start off with? Um, Start off with David and then we'll go Anthony. Well, I think uh, residents made some very good points and I think the officers made some very good responses to those. I mean, clearly business is important. Everybody needs jobs. Uh, HGVs have two particular issues. One is the fact that uh, there's a lot of um, pollution coming from them. And two, they're probably not driven uh, as carefully as they should be. And uh, on, again, I know it's qualitative, but I'm sure people get the impression that most of them are driving at more than 20 or 30 miles an hour. So I think the starting point has to be a motion to say that uh, the council needs a, an increased emphasis on monitoring and working towards uh, slower traffic, but also uh, less polluting uh, HGVs. Those would be my two motion points. Thank you very much for that. Anthony? Thank you. Um, I think one of the issues that came through, and there were a few things that came through, but one of them was the, the sheer numbers of different organisations involved in the enforcement of problems with HGVs, whether it's planning conditions, whether it's London councils for, for larger lorries, whether it's the police for speeding. Uh, and I thought if nothing else, a, a, a very simple recommendation might be to, uh, to to add some information for residents on this to, to the council's website. So it's in one place um, that councillors and, and council officers can direct residents to. So I've got some wording on that uh, as well that's, that's drafted out, which I can share. But it's a very simple, very simple okay. recommendation. OK, I think um, unless anyone else puts a hand up, I think we've, we've clearly got two areas there, and I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of, of both. So um, we've got one on information and um, and how we collect that. Actually, they're both on information, really. One on that and one on David's point about um, increased monitoring where funding is available to do that. Um, can I just, before we actually talk about the actual wording, can I just ask Paul or, or Paul or Gary to just come back on those two area, areas from a practicality perspective? Are, are, are these achievable? feasible i don't yet know and that's that's the honest answer um these will have resource implications in the team perhaps financial uh, i think until we understand better okay. you know, data for example data collection is very expensive um very hard borough wide as well uh, unless we start using digital digitally accessible information like sat nav or data um getting information on the website yes we, we can we can do that so i think okay. we just need to be mindful of there will be resource implications on this but until Fine. we feel understand the recommendations, I don't know what that'll be. Fine. Anthony, let's in a second, let's hear your, your motion written down. I was proposing on David's point. So unless David, you've got better words to the contrary, what about something like um uh, the pan and I, I can revisit this later on, Rosie, for you. Um the panel um um welcomes the the work the council has done so far on um on um uh, HGVs and would uh, in, and incentivize um, where where particular funds are available for more monitoring targeted on um, I think we we agree on the, on the sort of the, the, the particular the, the Wimbledon area we any, any particular focus David you want yeah I think Aidan yeah your, your points are well made I think we need to say uh, HGVs, um, th there should be an increasing emphasis on HGVs within the borough with regard to uh, speed and pollution. And we would ask if uh, council uh, could 
uh, make some proposals to mitigate this? Yeah, I think so. Let's let's rewind that into uh, formally. So uh, yeah, let's recommend that um, future Merton take uh, recommendations um, away to assess, uh, but cabinets um, need to agree these actions. So let's think about this. So I think so. The, the panel supports the work the council's done so far on HGVs, um, and would encourage further work in this area, particularly focused on the areas um, residents raised as concern. Does that seem reasonable? I've got nods. So do we have a, a yes. sorry, Nick? Uh, just that you 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 mentioned resource implications. Paul McGarry mentioned resource implications. I think we need to have something in the motion about resource implications so it doesn't look like a wish list. We, we, if no, I agree, I agree. If we're gonna put something forward, we, 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 we want the cabinet to take note of it. I agree. Uh, so why don't we have what I've just outlined? Um, so that's, um, Panel welcomes the work um, the council has done so far on HGVs, encourages a wider emphasis um, across the borough on, on numbers and emissions, and um, increased fo uh, focus on uh, those areas outlined by residents where financial resources are available. Was that reasonable? So can I have a second of them? Dan? And Anthony as well. Do I need to put so? Do I need to show up this to a vote? All those in favour? Unanimous. Fantastic. Chair, yeah, would you be able to send me the official wording because it changed a couple of times in between? No worries. I'll definitely do that, Rosie. Thank you. Um, go for it, Ben. I just add: um, Is it possible to add to the work program, perhaps? Um, uh, some sort of report on ways we can better measure the the kind of in terms of HGVs, but also any kind of um, measurement overall of offending vehicles or speeding vehicles options for the council that might not have large financial implications. Maybe we need to review that as a panel as well and see the options on the on the table. I think it's a very very. Um... That's a very good point. If we, if Rose, if you can add that to the the actions, but I think um, our motion, if there's funding, if there's a grant available, would then help with the information for that particular item moving forward. So thank you. Um, brilliant. So Anthony, you had a point about information. Yes. Yeah, so draft wording here is the panel recommends that an information hub to support residents in dealing with complaints about problems with HTVs is created and added to the Merton websites and advertised appropriately. So the idea is basically simply to pull some of that information into one place uh, and so councillors and officers can direct residents um, to the appropriate place without having to explain, no, that's a planning issue, you need to go to you know, planning control, that's a police issue, that's London councils. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Is there any objections to that? No? No? Uh, Dan, is that a second? Yep. Yeah. Cool. So... Um, all those in favour? Brilliant. Love a bit of joined up working. Excellent. Um, Chris, would you mind just, again, I, I'm just mindful of that practicalities again, before we move on to some more recommendations. How, how, what, what, what we've said so far, how does that play with you? I think that's been a really helpful discussion and um, uh, the ambition is clearly in line with our ambition around improving air quality and safety on the roads in the borough. Um, I think what's best is if we take away the, the written motions and uh, agreements that have been reached this evening and look at how practically we can do that within the resources that we have available mm. without adding to the financial burden and perhaps bring that to either the next meeting of this scrutiny panel or the one after, depending on the timing. I can't remember the next date. Um, but with Paul's team, uh, we can, I'm sure, look at how practically we can deliver the ambition that you want to see uh, within the, uh, the available resources and the capacity uh, that we have available. Cool. No, thank you. Um, ben, and then we'll move on to some more recommendations. Can I can just uh, mention that, um, it's Chris, you mentioned uh, the Department of Transport are actually funding a bit more in terms of London boroughs going forward, maybe in that 
in that consideration that the panels will see in the future, um, we can then see what you know what is available to us that doesn't include TFL. You know, if there's any other options, um, any any opportunity to make further bids to other funds as well. Cool. No, I completely agree. So um, thank you. So let's it's now with um, item uh, six, the roadworks and utilities in mind. Um, there's so I've got a recommendation, but I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. So we've got Anthony, anyone else? Anthony, go for it. Thank you. Um, essentially, the same same recommendation as, as, as made previously. Um, most of the queries I and my group get about this um, could be answered by explaining how the kind of proactive work uh, works and is established. And so I think it's some more information on how you know, Merton obviously goes through a very technical process to understand, you know, which, which roads are going to be resurfaced and which pavements are going to come next. And I think if there's a bit more information about that for residents, that could help. Cool. So we're talking about, uh, again, more of a just an information hub and bringing that together on the on the website. That seems reasonable. Um, any objections? We've got a second, as well. Dan? Brilliant. Okay. Do you want me to, to read, a, read some wording? Uh, go for it. Uh, this panel recommends that more information with regards to road and footpath maintenance and repair, especially with regards to proactive work and how that is established, is added to Merton website and advertised appropriately. Um, I think if we could slightly tweak it to say con um, to continue, uh, con uh, continue and enhance, provide information to residents on that, if that's possible. And I can definitely be happy with that. I'm not so fussed about the wording. I think the principle's clear. Good. So is. yeah, that's fine. Everyone happy? Nick, you've got a point? Well, the principle is very clear, but the devil might time, be a tiny bit in the detail of that. Can you go through that again, Anthony, just, just so that, because uh, uh, there was quite a bit of sub-clausing going on there. Sure. Um, I'm not sure how it's affected by by Aidan's wording, so so he may need to chip in how he wants to change it. Um, the panel recommends that more information with regards to road and footpath maintenance and repair, especially with regards to the proactive work and how that is established, is added to the Merton website and advertised appropriately. So I think the focus should be how and why Merton decides on its proactive work. I think that's the bit that's, that the residents don't understand. All good. So my uh, my only comment on that is just to, to instead of using the word more, just enhance, because there's information there. But as we know, we can go into geeky detail about how websites work. Um, it, it's you know it, it just needs to be brought to the surface. So if you wouldn't mind just rereading that final time with that word change. Okay. Uh, panel recommends that enhanced information with regards to road and footpath maintenance and repair, especially with regards to proactive work and how that is established, is added to the Merton Council website and advertised. Cool, that's fantastic. So there's, there is a lot of information there already, so we can identify what the what the what the challenge is. Um, and I know there's a life map as well of road work, so it's it's probably how how do we all surface that as a as a thing. So I'm happy to support that as to to second that. Um, so can we go to a vote? I know Dan as well support it, support it, support, 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 support it. So all in support? Good. All right, fantastic. Um, so um, next item, is, do we have anything further on this item? Nope. I mean, I, for one, more have more of a business item than a recommendation, but it's it's if we can revisit this um, sort of smart cities in our work program uh, and just to, if there's any sort of nods um, of agreement, because it's, it's really interesting to, to hear what we're doing on the area. Cool. Sounds good. All right. So we've got a third and final bit um, about active travel. It also includes um, school streets. Do we have, um, I've got a recommendation. David, do you have a recommendation? Uh, well, you start, yours. Fantastic. Um, one second, let me just pull up. So um, I would like to propose uh, that we as a panel welcome the decisive action uh, from the council on establishing the largest number of school streets in London and request uh, communications to encourage further resident feedback and uh, explore 
expanding the scheme with the support of schools. Do I have a seconder? So Nick, um, shout that. So uh, who, who does in favor? Opposed? No, nope. great stuff. Thank you very much. Um, David, you had a... Yeah, so uh, uh, with regard to low traffic neighborhoods, um, it's important that uh, councillors are involved from the beginning mm. and their views need to count. And uh, consultation uh, needs to be based on a wider um, um, uh, wider uh, area and not based just on uh, roads, uh, specific roads affected. I think that's, that's a really interesting point. And I'm going to bring Nick in a second. Um, I'm also conscious also that if we, we need to learn a bit more about the process. Um, but it'd be good to hear about uh, um, how we put that into a, a, a recommendation. Um, I'll call Nick in next, and then I've got an idea about that as well. Nick? I just want to say where timing and budgets allow, because obviously what, what happened with the, uh, the the schemes last year, we, we we our officers weren't allowed to do that effectively. So so we, we, we don't want to, to, to beat them with a stick that needn't necessarily be there. Uh, uh, would that would that help that wording? Well, uh, no, no, where, the, time, where time and budgets allow. Well, I see. I, in terms of LTNs, mm. um, they've got to be the right ones. And um, as much as we haven't discussed these tonight, I know a number of councillors sitting on this committee and other councillors are, are saying they're not the right ones. So I accept it's hard to put a motion in. We were told at the beginning the councillors would be fully involved. Okay. And I don't know how you put that together as a motion. But the key thing is, is that we must make sure that uh, the councillors and residents are the priority, uh, not the officers and the money and the council. Why don't we take this away as an action rather than a recommendation and let have it a chair's action that um, we look at what we do in this area and may involve a briefing or a series of briefings so that we can understand this and come up with a bit more of a sort of concrete pose. And then we know that can revisit this again on the work pro. And if you're unsatisfied, then sort of go further. Would that be OK, David? Uh, yes, I accept it's tough to make that uh, proposal now, uh, yeah. but it's key that people are aware of the issues faced, but I accept cool. what you said. Super. Um, anyone for anything else? Great stuff. No, thank you so much. Um, so we're on to, back on to um, the budget now. So um, can I, is it, would it be Caroline first kicking off or Tobin? Uh, hi, Chair. Uh, probably it would be me kicking off first. If that's okay. All right. So um, you'll have in front of you the papers, which has updates from September, November, December, and now January Cabinet report. So the January Cabinet report was circulated <laughs> very helpfully by my colleague, uh, Councillor Hayne Monday, yesterday. Um, so apologies that that came through in that way. So clearly, with the difficulties we've had in trying to pull information together, it's been quite complicated, but we've tried to help you through with the information you now have in front of you. And this panel is the only one that only has one meeting before your next meeting. Your next meeting is the 23rd of February, which is after the day after the final cabinet meeting for the council. Um, so unfortunately, that's why you only get one bite at sort of the um, additional cherry um, for, for some of the, these savings. So what you will see is that we brought um, an update to the budget gap and showed how that had changed. And I suppose if you look back in sort of September, how it's changed November and the December, it has been quite a fluid um, MTFS update that we've been bringing to you. Um, and I can assure you when the numbers come again in February that they will be changed again. Um, but what we started off with doing was going through the assumptions that we have around pay, price, um, some of the income, setting savings targets, and then asking directors to come forward with the proposals for um, cabinet and scrutiny to look at. With the first round of proposals that came forward to the November cabinet, we did not have at that time the equality assessments. So they came back again in December and they then became part of your lovely information pack that you got, uh, which you've been asked to bring with you to all sort of future meetings all the way up until full council meeting. So that has the detailed um, savings proposals. <laughs> Certainly, I would say I've got all my tabs, so I've been quite lucky I've got one sort of um, to hand as well. Um, tabs, it's got 
service plans as well. So revised service plans this year. Um, so we sort of combined elements and made them longer and hopefully more meaningful for you. And again, those are drafts. So if you have any comments on those to feedback, as well as clearly the um, draft equality assessments. So what we're saying is that we go through those. Again, if you see any changes or have any suggestions for how they could be improved or areas we may have missed, then please do let us know. Some of the equality assessments will only be, um, will be, continue to be revised until the proposals are looked to be implemented. So some of them are still a few years away. So there's still plenty of time to revise them. Clearly, the, normally the December cabinet paper is when we have almost the final knockings and, and we know quite what's coming our way and therefore see what the, the amount of the gap is. But we did not have um, a settlement announcement because that didn't come through to the 17th of December and clearly we didn't have a fair funding review that was meant to be three years um, or the business rates review so that made it quite difficult to bring forward but we knew that we were going to have some required savings uh, and therefore that's what we sort of set about looking at for November and December cabinet um, and then as a result of the, the settlement we have brought further savings to cabinet yesterday um, and those are being sort of brought forward in front of you tonight and for this panel in particular predominantly income um, or efficiency savings but you still may want to, to go through those in detail. So clearly COVID has had a major impact on the um, finances of the authority during this year and is now continuing to have an impact on next year. And I think originally when we were looking at some of the information that's coming through, we thought it would only be the tail impact in 21-22. And I think that is going to now be very significantly different with the further lockdowns that we have had. So we did get some additional one-off funding for COVID. Uh, which has been extremely helpful, um, but we don't know at this stage if it is going to be sufficient. So with the papers that were in front and were presented to Cabinet last night, um, the, the gap has now um, changed from what's re reported previously. I'm sorry, just trying to find um, the revised gap for you. Um, so we have balanced at this stage 21-22 um, and we have a gap of just under 6 million uh, for 22-23 rising to 14.7 million in 24-25. Um, we're still waiting to see if the spending review will actually go ahead following year for three years or with everything that's going on and um, the capacity of the Treasury and also the MHCLG to undertake a spending review, I think will still be uh, very difficult for them to do. Clearly, the use of business rates as a source of funding for local government, I think, is now very much at risk. Um, and you will see in the paper which went to Cabinet last night that um, London um, authorities have agreed to not go ahead with a business rate pool for 21-22. That it was just too much of a risk and some authorities thought that they were going to um, potentially lose more money by being in the pool than by being out of the pool. And I think and that just shows you some of the impact that we are expecting um, on businesses going forward. We are experiencing an increase in appeals against for, for businesses for their rates, either retail or particularly office. Um, and some of those in other areas have been backdated to pre-COVID conditions. So there's quite a significant impact for us. Furlough also has been extended to the end of April, but there is still the risk that that could be extended again, depending on how um, response to the, the pandemic continues. So we have also gone through and updated the assumptions around the dedicated school grant. And as I said at Cabinet last night, that is the worst case, I'm hoping the worst case scenario at this stage. Um, there is some detailed work kicking off um, to then see what actions can be done to look to, to reduce that deficit. Um, whether we'll actually get it be covered completely, I think maybe quite ambitious, but we'll certainly work um, on that basis to be able to do so. Um, there had been an announcement in the uh, spending review announcement that the pay award for public sector had been frozen. 
However, that is for where they determine the pay for, there's a, a national body that determines pay. Pay for local authorities is different, it's determined by the Employers Association um, who get together and look at that. So at this moment in time, we have still left in a provision for a pay award, but we have reduced it from what we had in previously, because we do feel that um, as part of the response to the pandemic and reduced monies, um, that there wouldn't be the level that we had thought we would get previously. Um, and there is also an update on the capital programme, uh, which for this panel, I think, has significant interest um, and changes. And we did say that because of the circumstances we were in, there was going to be no new capital bids during the programme, apart from if they could be funded by SIL. So those SIL um, funded schemes have come through through the monitoring reports and onto council where necessary um, through the, the regular updates to cabinet during the course of this year and being fed in. We are encouraging um, budget managers to look at their capital schemes and slip as much as possible. We are experiencing difficulties with suppliers to be able to do some of the things we need to do or delays in how we actually undertake some of the works itself with some of our staff available to be able to undertake and manage those either being diverted elsewhere or unfortunately um, not being well themselves. There is clearly quite a lot of information in here um, and I don't know chair if you wanted to pause and take questions on the overall update for the, the business plan. Um, and then go into detail for the savings for this particular panel and service plans um, or how you then wanted to do that. Thank you. I think you very perceptively know, know exactly how I want to tackle this. Uh, <laughs> so I think, yeah, so you have high level questions first and then we'll go into the detail next round. Uh, do we have some hands up? So we've got Anthony, um, who else? One second. Anyone else? Anthony, David, and um, I may add something as well to this. Anthony first. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Caroline, for this and, and the work of your, your team on, on doing this and pulling all this together. I wanted to ask about the assumptions around the uh, around pay increases and the provision made for that um, on the basis that the 2020 increase, I understand, agreed was, was 2.75, but we've made much less provision for that. And I think the government has made noises about teachers, for example, receiving higher higher pay awards going forward. I just wonder if, if the reaction to, to the sort of co to COVID might actually be for some of these, what are perceived as key workers actually to, to receive higher uh, pay increases going forward. Whereas we seem to be assuming that the impact will be that there are lower pay increases. So I just wondered if you could give me a bit more detail around those assumptions. And then as sort of, separate but related point was about plans for the London Living Wage. I, I know that a lot of work has gone into understanding what the, the impact of that would be on our contracts. And I just wondered if uh, there was any provision being made at this stage to actually begin rolling any of that out. So a question, David. Oh, right. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, Caroline, so I know that you keep um, as by law to the generally agreed accounting principles of prudency and consistency. So I noticed that all of your uh, potential issues are in your numbers, um, but I can't quite see all of the potential upsides from uh, direct government grants, which were offered um, specifically to do with COVID. So if those grants that came in in the last six months of the year um, are available for the next three months of the year, uh, then I assume you're going to be in quite a surplus, aren't you? Okay. And my question, uh, no, thank you, David, on that. Uh, um, my question is, it's about the volatility of this environment. How are you working across uh, uh, counterparts in other, borough, in other boroughs, not across London councils in the LGA, to, to understand this? Because it's, you know, it's moving quite rapidly um you know we've we've seen some national mutes about whether council tax may be abolished and changed uh, and i know um from my work in nhs that the the covid work um especially with asymptomatic testing and supporting vaccination is a hell of a lot of money and a lot of planning and officer time away from business as usual operations um so it'd be good to just understand the impact on on that as well Right. OK, so in para 2.3.1, um, we set out the assumptions on pay. Uh, and as I said, we've reduced it from 2% down to 1.5% over the, the life of the, of the plan. Um, 
whilst there may be some noise around teachers getting a higher pay award, unfortunately, I would say local government workers aren't seen as necessarily the right key workers or we're not as loved as some of the, the teachers and nurses. So we feel that we may not get the support to have a higher pay rise than what we set aside for at this stage. Um, so but hopefully we remain to be convinced. And the pay award last year was a two year deal. Um, so whether that could be something which could be over two years and therefore it might be higher for 21, 22 and therefore lower in 22, 23. But we thought it was still wise to leave something in um, and then wait and see what would be done on that score. Um, and then at the top, just before power 232, that shows you the additional cost of London living wage on major contracts. Um, so, but it would depend as to when we look to, to re-let those individual contracts, whether or not we are including London living wage. And I think you'll see in the um, December report that some of the contracts had already previously gone out um, without including that at this stage. So there has been a, an adjustment to that in the um, January, January cabinet paper yesterday, just for 21, 22. Um, with regards to the upsides for, for government grants, so in some of the grants that we have, um, Councillor Dean, some are specifically ring fenced for um, purposes and therefore will be carried forward to fund ongoing expenditure. Um, so the contain outbreak management fund, some of the track and trace monies will be look, looked at in this way. But in the report that we took to Kevin um, last night, um, we actually identified a potential 1.1 million underspend um, when you take into account some of the additional income we've received um, and taking out some of the ways that we have to account for the council tax and business rates. Um, but that was done before the further national lockdown. Um, and indeed, as part of the um, monitoring we're looking to do for February, there's been a significant swing in parking income again. Um, so we are finding that as soon as a national lockdown occurs, our parking income does fall quite dramatically. Um, but certainly we are looking to build in those upsides. Um, and within the cabinet report that was circulated, so in Paris 7.1, you will see we got COVID um, grant and a local council tax support scheme grant totaling 6.8 million, which we have included within those numbers to bring the gap down in 21, 22, back down to nil. So we are including upside where we know, and we have flagged in that cabinet report that we are looking at the sales fees and charges um, assumptions for the first three months of next year, but we haven't got the details as how they're going to work to um, build some monies in, but we are aware that that may come through at a later stage, but we flagged it. So hopefully we, uh, we don't forget it, and I'm sure uh, someone will remind us if we do. Um, clearly the, the volatility is tremendous around this. Um, indeed, yesterday we had announced a social care staffing grant. Um, so we're going to get some additional money um, to help some of our care home providers and um, residential care um, residential care homes. But it's an amount of money to be spent by year end. So we've got 10 weeks to spend that money and get it out the door. And we've said, you know, thank you very much for giving us the money. But that's really difficult to then gear up, get that money out um, and demonstrate that it can be spent. So that's some of the, the challenges that we have. Um, and I'm part of a, a sounding board with colleagues from um, representing unitaries, counties, METs, uh, London districts, who then sort of meet regularly with colleagues from mainly MHCLG, but they do then bring in Treasury, DHSE and DWP to talk through some of the situations we're facing. Um, and indeed, uh, one of, um, I'm sure you know David Kepler, one of his staff, um, was um, speaking with the Treasury to see how the social isolation payments were working or not working um, in some instances um, to try and give them some insight as to how they may look to change the scheme to make sure that more people will benefit or isolate in, in the first place to stop the, the spreading of the, the virus. Thank you very much. No, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to hear that as well, especially your, your network. Um, work as well. Um, second round. So we had Ben, Dan, and anyone else? I've got something to add. So Ben first. Yeah, thank you, Caroline, uh, for all your work there and your team. Um, 
in terms of being able to plan um, in, in terms of the medium uh, financial strategy, um, it seems to me, and I'm nowhere near an expert, but a lot of these extra funds coming from government in this difficult time are one-offs. Is, um, and, you know, is that correct? What proportion, roughly, would you say are one-offs? Um, and we would still see, you know, having to plan, you know, in terms of four years and further down the line, that it might seem like the funding is very good now, but going down the line, it still doesn't help our ongoing costs, especially um, the costs that from our, um, what might be semi-permanent um, losses in terms of council tax income, parking income and other things that are not quite covered for, by those direct funds. And uh, if we take Dan. Yes, thank you. General question about staffing costs. Uh, traditionally, Caroline, um, you, you always mentioned to us that staff costs are quite high for the borough, uh, as in most businesses, councils and organisations. Um, so my question is, how, how much extra money has, it, uh, has the taxpayer now had to find to fund the uh, staff's extra days free holiday that's been given to them by the council leader? Um, it, and also, does he have any plans or you have any plans to do any other such extra gimmicks and where's the money going to come from? It's a bit harsh there, Dan. Um, so uh, I think, so we've got obviously questions on, on, on Ben on, on, on the uh, finding the, the cost there, obviously Dan's question. I think my question is sort of building on your previous answer, Karen, about um, that networked approach and, and, and pushing back to, 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 to Treasury and, and DCLG. Um, how, how has been how has been the response? Because it, it, it seems, I mean, so on one, that perfect example of the social grant, on one hand, it's obviously very helpful money, but on the other side of things, seeing it from a political lens, if you can't spend it or use it, it you know, you, you've been offered it, but it's, it's pretty much unhelpful because, you know, you're spinning in five different directions at once. Um, so it, it's just understanding their reaction back a bit further. All right. So if you've got the cabinet paper from last night, um, Appendix 2 shows some of the um, grants that we're getting funded by sort of down the bottom of that table. So you can see the 6.8 um, million doesn't continue as one off, um, whereas we are showing some ongoing impact of COVID over the next three years. Um, slightly above that, so 4.2 million going down to sort of 974,000 in 23-24. Um, there's some reductions in income um, assumptions. So there is, I think, what we're also nervous about, London is nervous about, is part of the fair funding review. Um, we may potentially lose money because clearly as part of the levelling up um, approach, we think that money will move north and to the counties. So as part of that, so we are nervous that not only will we not get sort of further one-off monies, but we could lose some further grants that we currently get at this moment in time. Um, so for our pay costs, so the um, notional cost of that extra day's leave is just over £300,000. Um, but we were having a discussion today amongst the senior officers as to the level of outstanding leave that there is in the organisation. Um, so we are concerned that our staff, because of the sterling work that they are doing, are not taking that annual leave. Mm. Um, so we will um, be encouraging where we can, and indeed amongst ourselves as well, to try and ensure that people do take that, that leave. Um, but I don't see it as a gimmick. I think our staff have um, worked tremendously hard throughout this, um, and it was um, welcomed, I think, certainly by staff to be able to do that. Um, so feedback certainly that we've had from when we've had our discussions with colleagues, giving them some tangible examples of some of the difficulties that we have. So an issue we had when we got some monies for our contained outbreak management fund, we went straight away and we were looking to get the um, lateral flow tests run by our community pharmacies. Uh, sort of we're all sort of engaged working through that. Um, and then the government came along and said, oh, we want sort of pharmacies to roll out vaccinations. So it's then quite difficult to balance that. So we're finding sort of we're coming up with ways that we want to spend the money. And then sometimes things move on so fast and it is a very fast moving um, world in some of these areas. And so giving them some concrete examples, they do come back. And I think certainly the fact that we got four tranches of COVID general funding, I think has shown sort of the 
responsiveness and trying to um, get people to understand the ability for us um, to that we need more money and indeed in the monetary report we are still showing that there is a cost to us of COVID in this financial year and we do expect that to be a knock-on impact next year. We are also flagging some of the monitoring returns that people have to do because these are people certainly in the front line trying to run whether it's modern assembly hall whether it's sort of working with care home providers um, to actually then provide the information back sometimes on a weekly basis, sometimes on a monthly basis can be quite challenging. And indeed some um, authorities and some districts have actually employed additional staff to help with all the monitoring, which in some ways also doesn't help um, the cause as well. It's uh, not necessarily an effective use of money in these circumstances. I know, thank you, Caroline. I know from my um, experience in the NHS, um, you know, trying to get bodies on the, uh, there to, to, to do all this stuff is, is challenging at the best of times. Um, so, and a lot of toil is built up. So it's, it's about best use of that for mental, but also um, physical health and, and, and just generally um, also from a business cost perspective too, but that's sort of the last consideration I know you, you and others have. And I want to just pull uh, Nick in because he put his hand up briefly and then move on a bit deeper um, to talk about more service plans. It was a very brief point, Chair, just to say that uh, any talk of gimmickry is thoroughly inappropriate. And uh, I will, at the end of this, be putting forward a, a, a motion in support of our, work, our, our workforce. Thank you. That's, that's good to hear. Thank you. Um, so can we move a bit deeper now into the actual uh, particular area and service plans? Um, I, know, uh, I know, Anthony, we, we've had a few rounds now of this, but if you can revisit it as part of um, the next... Bit, that'd be that'd be helpful um so can we can we go a bit deeper about in terms of our particular uh sort of the departments we look at as a panel um who caroline would you so um if you then have a, a look i think at the the pack but then i think chris and his um team are better placed to take you through mm. any detailed questions on this and um, so I, I would hand over to, to chris at, the, at this stage if that's that's okay of course so, Chair, just to help, um, I'm actually reading from two sets of cabinet papers in order to get the full picture uh, of the savings because they were presented both to November's cabinet and then a, an additional set to cabinet last night. Um, starting with those uh, savings that went to the November cabinet and just running through them, hopefully members have got those in front of them. Um, the first saving was uh, a future Merton saving for £100,000 next year. Uh, and that was for street works income, uh, a matter that's been touched upon this evening. Uh, and this is based upon our experience of the income that we're getting from those who wish to work on our streets. So it's already anticipated. We've seen that growth in the income uh, and we're confident that that can be budgeted for. The second saving is um, an increase in income from planning performance agreements in development control. Uh, and this is through a, an adjustment in the way that we manage the relationship with larger developers uh, and seek and reach planning performance agreements. And the, again, um, it's based on our experience uh, and we're confident that that income can be generated through the establishment of a, a dedicated majors team. And all of these, happy to answer questions on, and I know that, that James and John are here. The third saving uh, in those November papers is um, a parking saving, and it's in future years. It's in 2023, 24, and the year after. And it's based upon our expectation that the back office will be transformed over that period, with much more of our business being done online, automated, with customers renewing permits without having to talk to somebody in the back office, uh, the use of Ringo uh, and the use of other technology in order to manage that process end to end. And we expect that to be a staff saving and for us to manage that down over time without the need for redundancies. Uh, then there's a, a saving relating to emissions-based charging. And that's been slightly amended in the papers that went to cabinet. Um, th this isn't an area that this panel's unfamiliar with. So you'll know the, the issues behind emissions-based charging and it sets out the anticipated income. The paper that went to Cabinet last night corrected 
the income that we expect in the last two years of that medium term financial strategy to uh, reduce uh, and reflect the reduction in the income that we expect to receive based on our better, more sophisticated understanding of uh, behaviours and where what we expect to see in income based on the permits we expect to sell, but also the change in behaviour of motorists towards less polluting vehicles. So there's a slight um, reduction in income in those last two years. So just turning then to the savings, the additional savings that went to Cabinet last night. Uh, the first one is a, a small saving for £12,000 next year in development and building control. And that's based upon supplies and services budgets that we believe we can give up. So again, we're confident that saving can be delivered. There's a £35,000 saving in Safer Merton, which isn't for this panel, uh, but it's there in the pack. Uh, and that's going to overview and scrutiny tomorrow night because they're responsible for that particular area. <clears throat> There's a saving in, in property management uh, of 100,000 the year after next, so 22, 23. That's in relation to a number of <clears throat> what were service tenancies for um, ex-employers, ex-employees of the authority, uh, where we believe we can uh, move more towards market rents for those properties. Um, and we're, that process is already beginning. It's detailed. Um, it takes some, some consultation and engagement. And we also have to change our relationship uh, as a, we have to deregister as a housing provider. Uh, housing provider provides secure tenancies. Uh, and we'll be moving away from that and more towards market rents for those properties. Uh, it's entirely doable and appropriate given the circumstances that those um, occupants live in properties uh, and no longer provide a service to the council, uh, which reflected the discounted rate that they were receiving. <clears throat> the next saving is an, another in parking and it's for 100,000 and another 100,000 a year after uh, related to on-street parking compliance. And this depends on some additional CEOs being employed uh, and based on the evidence that we have, there is still a degree of non-compliance on our streets. Uh, which we will be able to manage uh, and the income uh, will reflect uh, the uh, income in excess of the staffing costs that we will incur uh, in order to manage that non-compliance. Uh, the last two savings, um, 52,000 next year in uh, waste services, reflects the expected income that we would achieve from the renewal of the kingdom, what we call the kingdom contract, the environmental enforcement contract, alongside our in-house environmental enforcement staff. So the focus on enforcement, generating that additional income alongside cleaner streets. And then the last saving is an efficiency saving as a result of uh, the upgrade in the system that manages development control uh, it's called M3. Uh, we're moving up to the Assure level of the system, uh, and that will allow us to release some staff in the back office. Again, we hope that that would be uh, without redundancies. We employ some agency staff for that admin function, uh, and we'll be able to release those. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, before I call on panel members to comment and ask uh, questions, does any of the cabinet members have any points? Or Tobin, do you have anything at all you want to add? Nothing to add, Chair, um, from the uh, general overview that Caroline provided. Um, I don't know whether uh, Martin or Rebecca wanted to comment on the specific savings that Chris has just outlined, because uh, they will sit with uh, one or the other of those, other than the waste one, I think, which sits with uh, the tax. And uh, Chair, nothing specific from me. I think um, the main uh, proposal, proposal that sits under my remit is emissions-based charging alongside Councillor Welton, and obviously happy to take questions on, on that. Um, and it went through Cabinet uh, last night as well. So um, nothing further to add. Nothing specific to add um, at this point, but I'm willing to take any questions. Brilliant. No, thank you, everyone. Um, so first round questions sort of focusing specifically on, on these the departmental 
income and savings uh, points and any service plans. So we had Anthony hands up. Anyone else? Dan? Anyone else for the time being? I've got something to add. So Anthony, go first. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to ask um, about one of the new savings proposals, the, the residential properties increase. Uh, in rents. I noticed that this on the equality uh, impact assessment is, a, is an outcome three, which is that it's perceived to have a negative um, impact on, on age age and socioeconomic status. Now I appreciate Merton adding socioeconomic status, it's not a projected characteristic, but this suggests to me that, that this is perceived to have you know, a, a negative uh, effect on a number of former employees who are, who are now past retirement age. I just wondered what mitigation um, we were thinking about putting in place or whether the quality impact assessment had advanced to that um, stage yet. And then very quickly, maybe a, a question for Rebecca, which is about the use of uh, the monies that are raised by the emissions-based uh, parking charges you know my view on this, um, I'm sure, already, um, but I just wondered if you're able to give any guarantees that the monies raised will be used to support uh, climate change, uh, climate emergency action or air quality action. Thank you, Anthony. Um, Dan? Thank you. Yeah, questions on the capital budget on page 81. Um, what's the... On the uh, uh, unallocated TfL budget for, that seems to be a lot of money, what's that for? Uh, replacement of fleet vehicles, uh, will they be low emission vehicles or will they be just like for like with the new diesels again? And um, uh, and the final one is the new street tree planting programme. Why is it a one-off year given that we've got a climate change and we're trying to do lots of trees every year? Uh, thank you, Dan. Um just add my point onto that and I'll do a quick summary. I'd be interested to hear more in actually linking on the service plan and your way of thinking, Chris, as a sort of cross departmental functions, the increased use of data and how, um, you know, we're using a lot more mapping systems as well. I'm trying to, we've already talked earlier on in the evening about um, sort of smart cities. It'd be great if you could expand on that a wee bit further in terms of how you, how you perceive things given the, both the volatility of the environment, but given the increased use of digital. So just summing it up, you know, we've got my point about uh, digitization agenda, uh, Dan's point about the capital budget, specifically unallocated budget for TfL and replacement vehicles and trees. Anthony's point about the protected characteristics outcome three and any mitigation and money on emissions-based um, parking charging. What happens with that? So quite a bit to deal with there. Um, I yeah. might deal with them in a random order in the Go way that I've written them down. The, um, just dealing with the points around smart cities and the use of technology. There's quite a lot going on in this area. There's a cross-council GIS, Geographical Information Systems project, uh, that we expect to deliver quite a transformation in the way that we can present um, maps uh, and the ability for residents to be able to report uh, defects, or request services, uh, pinpoint issues. So that will underpin a lot of functionality uh, that this department in particular, e &R, will be able to uh, tap into in order to achieve further transformation going forward um, and make it easier for customers, citizens to be able to access information uh, and to be able to request services as necessary. And we're also looking at the whole smart cities agenda and we've been fortunate and successful in uh, with our south london partnership uh, neighbors uh, getting around three million pounds uh, from a, a share of resources to invest in internet of things which might sound a bit gimmicky but this will allow us to pilot uh, functions and products which will allow citizens to do things more easily uh, Paul mentioned a very good example about the sensors in gullies, but it doesn't stop there. These might be air quality monitors that can provide real time information about air quality near schools and in areas where we know that we have disadvantaged and, uh, and less healthy communities. It might be information about recording footfall so that we know about business activity and economic um, strength in our areas uh, and the opportunities are endless.
and with our neighbours, we're looking at how we can uh, best utilise that money in order to, over the next two or three years, which is the timescale of the programme, um, invest in the right things and, and roll that out. And then hook that up to our GIS system so that we, over time, transform the way that we present, use uh, uh, the data that's, uh, that's collected. Um, on the tree budget, um, my understanding is that the additional SIL monies are for two years whilst we review the success of that. So it shouldn't be there for one year. Apologies if that's the way it's presented, but we've got an extra £40,000 for two years to plant additional trees. And that first year is being rolled out now. I think those, the details of those trees are, are, are online uh, and we're seeking to add to the stock of trees right across the borough rather than just deal with the, uh, the dead trees and the, uh, the ones that we're having to take out. Uh, and that's, it's important to note that that SIL allocation allows us to allocate a small amount of revenue alongside the capital investment, because one of the things that's hindered our ability to be able to roll out more trees has been the insurance liability, the maintenance costs, uh, and some of the other uh, revenue costs that sit alongside it. And with the pressure on revenue, um, it's always easy to look at capital as being the solution, but unless you've got the revenue to support that capital investment, uh, the tree could just uh, wither away and die. So then on, I'll ask James in a moment, I'm just teeing James up to deal with the unallocated TFL budget because um, I'm having to deal with so many computers here. I feel a bit like Rick Waitman at his keyboards um, that I've got iPads open and other computers too. Uh, so I haven't looked at that one yet. But on the replacement of fleet vehicles, it, it really depends on whether the technology is available for us to go for a... Uh, an electric vehicle, but certainly to move towards a lower polluting vehicle. And that will be our choice. Well, the first choice will be, do we need that vehicle at all? Uh, and we will be going through a rationalisation of the vehicles that we use as a council. We will need to use some, but we will share more and we will get rid of more. Uh, and then we'll look to those that we replace as to whether there is a viable and economically viable option that is lower polluting and ideally an electric one. Um, now, those don't exist for some use classes and for some vehicles. So the passenger transport fleet, for example, the, the torque and the weight needed for those vehicles just doesn't lend itself at the moment to an affordable electric solution. But that will come. And certainly when we're renewing the waste collection and street cleaning contracts, that will be a feature that's central to that negotiation to look at how by 2030 that contractor, whether it's Veolia or anyone else, can move towards a more clean fleet um, and ideally a completely zero carbon fleet. Just before I hand over to James, and uh, just to touch upon the EA for um, the increase in the rents for the ex-service tenancies. You're right, it isn't a protected characteristic, but we have identified it uh, as a potential impact. I suppose it's worth putting it into the context of that the occupants of these properties have enjoyed exceedingly low rents compared to the rents that other residents in the borough are paying for some considerable time and beyond the period that they have been in the employment of the borough. Uh, and the, the rent level was set at a level which reflected the services that they were providing whilst occupying those properties in the main. Uh, and it is not unreasonable uh, for the council taxpayer, I believe, to expect that that rent level now reflects something closer to the market rent uh, and to provide proper notice for that and alongside to mitigate, as, as Councillor Fairclough is looking for, to provide those residents with appropriate advice and guidance about how they can meet that demand if in the event of their economic circumstances that's challenging and to provide them with support and advice around both housing options but also how welfare advice uh, via citizens advice or other sources. I hope that won't be necessary um, and I'm not here to discuss the economic circumstances of those individuals, but I think it is legitimate to uh, seek to move those towards the market rents that others are paying in the borough for very uh, attractive and desirable properties. Uh, and I think the last point was, a, uh, sorry, I'll hand over to James on the point around um, unallocated TfL monies. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Chris. And if I can just add on the service tenancies, we're also looking at a phased um, build up to the full payment and that's been factored in on, as, as one of the options in the saving. Um, I've feverishly been looking to ascertain what the TFL underspend is um, 
um, haven't been able to discern that, but what I, I will do is I will um, look into the, the underspend um, and come back to the, the panel and um, let them know through through Rosie, if, if I may. Um, unless Caroline's able to shed any light on it, apologies, it's not something I'm, fam I'm immediately familiar with. Well, well no, we, we assume a certain amount of funding from TfL, but we then look to work with them to actually devise the schemes that's appropriate. So, so I think sort of picking up on Councillor Dean's point earlier, we want to make sure that we get the, the right schemes that are being funded um, for residents. Um, so that's what we look to do. So we put in a marker, um, so similar to the um, school's unallocated monies, and then during the course of the year and the medium term, we will look to allocate that out. But I suppose it's just flagging. We are still hopeful those future years allocations will be available, but it will be dependent on the clearly of, of TFL going forward. Thanks, Caroline. Super. So just picking up, um, before I do that, I was going to pick up some, just one or two of the questions that are yet to be answered. But is we're coming up to 10 o'clock. Is everyone happy if we extend to, um, say, 20 past 10? Can I get some nods? Yeah. Then 15 minute intervals generally, and then we have to repeat that so often. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll say half past then. Is everyone happy? Great. All right. Well, it's in your gift to, to, to be brief and succinct in your uh, questions as well. So, all right. So I'm um, just picking up some of the, the two points um, I, I think are outstanding. Apologies if, if they're not. So just expanding a bit more on the emissions based charging monies. And I think maybe this may be for you, Caroline, I don't know, uh, the capital budget on page 81. So we've, we've answered the TFL unallocated. Yeah. Done the, the tree. So I think that's covered. Oh, fine. Or, okay. um, Captain Holden's questions on capital. Is it fine? Okay. And is there anything on the emissions-based charging? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I, I can come in because um, I think oh. Councillor Fairclough directed that um, to me. I think he raises a really important point and one that I know that we discussed at scrutiny last time. I hope he's somewhat reassured by the report that went to Cabinet last night, which indicated a commitment to reinvesting income into tackling air pollution and the climate emergency, which also came to, to Cabinet last night. And I know he, he spoke there, um, but also particularly around encouraging sustainable travel. So for instance, subsidizing the annual rental cost for um, cycle parking space and also um, parklets in, in parking bays. So um, I hope he's, he's sort of reassured by, by those points in there, but fundamentally um, it is critical that we, we look to continue to review and measure um, how the scheme is meeting those overall objectives in terms of uh, addressing air quality. Thank you very much. Um, I know Ben has a, a put his hand up for a question and then let's turn to um, recommendations as well. Ben? Uh, Chris covered my point, so thank you, Chair. Fantastic. Um, is there anything else? Sorry, there's one question I believe that's standing. I think, Anthony, you have a question about the council tax. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, this this was um, the more towards the more general kind of business plan rather than the um, specifics uh, for the, this this panel. Um, it was uh, Caroline. I wondered if you might explain some of the assumptions around the, the council tax collection figure. Um, I've seen what it is and how it's changed during the various reports, and and also just maybe confirm my understanding of the is it the collection fund that looks like i think a pool of the uh, between us the gla and the government of, of uncollected council tax so basically the loss of, of uncollected council tax but i wasn't sure i was completely right in my understanding there all right so our, our council tax um has been sort of more volatile this year than previously. So assumptions that we normally build into the MTFS um, in the previous years has been a 2% increase in the, the council tax, or as um, Councillor Tobin reminded me, below the referendum limit, so 1.99%. Um, and we also have a 3% adult social care preset, but because that's ring fenced for adult social care, it does not have an impact on the bottom line. Um, within the papers that you have in front of you in the appendix, um, what has happened this time round, um, the, the council tax support scheme that we run, there are more people claiming council tax support scheme and more people have been impacted, I think, by COVID and therefore um, either job losses or just general um, income loss. 
So for the first time in sort of a, a number of years, our council tax base has actually changed and gone the wrong way, as it were. So we have seen a reduction in um, the level of, of council tax that we will collect. Um, I think and a slight reduction in the number of additional properties that we thought we were going to have coming on stream as well. There's clearly a number of new builds um, are slower to come on board than we thought. Um, the collection fund is very complicated because what we have to do is pull together all of the council tax and all of the business rates and then work out the share for the GLA for the government and what our share is. Different percentages for council tax and for business rate um, and we are not allowed to have a deficit on the collection fund. However, one of the um, benefits we've been given due to COVID is to spread that deficit over three years. So, but we need to work out what that deficit is. Um, and we do that based on a return, which is due the end of this month. Um, we also get some information from someone who helps us with the level of appeals. There's a backlog of appeals and we've still got some appeals outstanding from the 2010 valuation list as well. So that doesn't help in trying mm -hmm. to work out the, the level of provision we need. Um, and we're also querying some of the details on the form because clearly during the course of this year, we've got a lot of additional business rates or um, businesses were not paying their business rates directly and therefore we got grant. That's not taken into account in some of the assumptions for next year. Um, and certainly we've been told at this stage there will be no business rate relief. Um, so that's going to have some further knock on impacts on that collection fund. But we hope to have a full update and explanation because every time we go to, to look at it, it's like we need some cold towels and then we'll come back to it. But there will be a further update um, on what it all does mean. But that's where the challenge at the moment for years, we've never had a deficit on the council tax, but we think we will have a deficit on the council tax and on the business rates. So it's then how we manage that going forward. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, I think that's a very good answer and answers that in full. Does it, Anthony, are you happy with that? Good. Um, yes, thank you. So unless there are any other questions, points, uh, I'd like to turn to uh, recommendations. Um, David. Yes, I think the first recommendation needs to be on the emissions based parking tax. Citrix workspace update uh, because, your um, basically, I'm so sorry, something else has come on. I accidentally touched this. Um, uh, basically, um, I've heard tonight that it's about uh, improving air quality, and the air quality is poorest in other areas, uh, and therefore this particular tax uh, will not work. So the motion must be to suspend this parking tax uh, and then find a way to reduce air toxicity in the areas where it's poor. Yeah, I second that. Okay, um, well, let's put it to a vote. Um, so could you could you recite your, your word in David, sorry? Sorry. That's uh, okay. Uh, that the emissions-based parking tax is based on increasing the cost of parking cars in areas with cleaner air. And it should be suspended uh, and replaced with something that will reduce uh, the pollution across the borough. How's that? So all those in favour? No. Against? Super. Thank you very much. Um, is there a further recommendation? Nick? It's the one that I, I, I said I was going to do, Chair, and I apologise for this because it's not something I'd normally feel the need to do. Before I do so, I'd like to thank Caroline Holland in particular for what she's done tonight. I think uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's obviously an incredibly difficult job this year, more difficult than, 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 than it's been in any other incredibly difficult year, quite honestly. And, and to, to make it, to, to be able to explain in the way that she has what what what, what has been done it's, it's really blown me away quite honestly but so anyway here's my my my, my motion this panel commends merton's environment and regeneration workers on their hard work expertise and positive attitude during the covid pandemic noting in particular they have worked within current limited resources to deal with necessarily increased duties and expresses the hope that they will be suitably rewarded as soon as conditions permit. Good motion. Um, would anybody, we, could anybody possibly disagree with that? I wouldn't. I would hope not. Is there a seconder? 
come on, come on, colleagues. Oh, thank right. you. Fantastic. So uh, all those in favour? Against? Not voting. Oh, come on. Well, there you go. That shows, Dan. That shows you. David, well, come on. It shows you that you bring out irrelevant rubbish. You should focus on the important things oh. and you've achieved nothing in what you've done. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, supposed but, to be about uh, items in, in so, this. Yeah, so I think, I, 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 I think, I, I think, in all due fairness, the door was opened by your question. Um, but anyway, so we are where we are. Um, ben. Well, we shouldn't waste the time on general things when it's about uh, things relevant to this panel. Well, there we go. Ben. Um, I did want to just, maybe it's not a motion, but just a note um, that in. So just reading these budget papers, the LGA themselves say, you know, this might be, I think their polite wording was um, the least bad funding review since 2010. Um, but also in terms of the uncertainty, it's still very high with, you know, there are funds coming in, but it's still a lot of unanswered questions in terms of a long-term planning in terms of budgets. Um, so being thankful for money that is coming in, but still wanting more um, certainty in the, in, the, in the long term. And I'm glad that we've got um, Caroline at the helm uh, and Tobin as well, um, and the great teams behind them. Um, as uh, you've said before in this, in this meeting that, you know, providing such detail to us, um, considering that uncertainty. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a further recommendation? No. Okay. Um, so I've got one basically uh, talking about the service plans actually. Um, and it'd be great to get some initial feedback. So it, here's the word. And so uh, the recommendation is uh, this panel um, welcomes the department's efforts uh, for digital innovation, particularly the use of a GIS system and recommend given uh, the increase in internet use uh, taken advantage of such innovation in full to support residents and service provision where resources and funding is available. Good. Do we have a seconder? Nick? Fantastic. Um, hey, Aidan, I hope you don't mind, but I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, what's your major point on that? So we've... T um, well, we've got a second and normally we don't talk, but I'll, I'll okay, expand on that. No, 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 so no I'll, I'll expand upon it just because it's a fair question. So we heard in the service plans increase use of digitization and um, mapping. And earlier on in the first half of our um, to tonight's session, we talked about how do we show, how do we collect data? All this together helps us um, paint a better picture of the borough and understand what's going on a bit better. So what I'm calling for is that we actually support and commend that work and encourage that work. Okay, would you mind just repeating what you said then? I hope of course, you're... no worries. Just in, in the light of getting cross-party support, I'll, I'll do that. Um, I, Nick, I know you've seconded it. Um, welcome the department's efforts for digital innovation, particularly the GIS system, and recommend given uh, the increase, given the increased use of internet, taking advantage of such innovation in full to support residents and service provision where resource and funding is available. So can I put it to a vote? All those in favor? Cool, opposed? Not voting? There you go, all right. Nearly got cross parties. Oh, sorry, it's just, it's just trying to understand it, that's all. No worries. Not cool. against it, but just trying to understand it. Yeah, it's just a bit unusual and unexpected, that's all. No, I, I completely understand. It was, it was off Chris's good points about the work you're doing. Okay, well, I think, um, I can close this, uh, I can, we can move on just to the final point, um, performance monitoring, uh, clearly. If, if I take my leave of you then, thank you very much for your time. No worries. Thank, thank you. you so much. And, uh, hats off to you and your team. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, you know, Chris, I don't think, we've talked about this before, it's, all, it's obviously COVID related, but is there anything particularly, any volatility you want to draw our attention to? No, I did go through the PIs this afternoon, Chair, before the meeting, and there was there's nothing that I'd draw your attention to that hasn't been raised before. Uh, as you cool. say, a lot of it is affected by COVID, but uh, with colleagues, happy to answer any questions that the panel has. Ben, Anne and David. 
Uh, yeah, I was going to say is, um, is there any plan, um, just on a process point, of, um, especially in the long-term measures, noting the COVID effects in these and putting them into context going forward in these reports? Good question, David. I, I couldn't see where it was, so I'm. I need to ask: Did you hit, <laughs> did you hit your recycling rate last month's stroke period, Anthony? I was actually going to ask about the recycling uh, one because we miss it by quite a lot, and I just wondered how that was consistent then with very, very uh, efficiently not sending very much to landfill. I don't understand how those two things can sort of fit together in terms of consistency. So we've got, I mean, ultimately it's COVID effect, I, I think, but we've got two on recycling rates and um, one on obviously COVID. Um, for essence of time, if it's, if, it's a, if it's a very detailed answer, we could probably revisit this outside. But Chris, do you have anything immediately to revisit this? Yeah, I'll let John uh, come in on, uh, on the point around recycling because he's been very patient and uh, not had very many speaking parts, um, but the, the, the we haven't hit the recycling target for this month. Um, it's a very stretching target, uh, and but it's a very high level of recycling we're already achieving, uh, but we want to improve it further. The amount going to landfill is very insignificant because really the only thing going to landfill is the bottom ash that comes out of the energy from waste plant. So it's either recycled it goes to energy from waste, uh, uh, or that's it. Um, we don't actually put any waste in the ground other than what cannot be uh, recycled as a consequence of having gone through energy from waste. Um, I don't know whether John wanted to add anything to that. Um, no, I would echo that. The establishment of the original recycling rate was on the premise of the of the new waste contracts before um, in anticipation in a perfect world of what it could achieve. Um, and, and we have subsequently changed um, due to the way we live and, and, and the, the way waste is, is managed. The most important is the fundamental and paradigm shift that we've had with waste now being not landfilled we have had, we were running at almost half of the waste being landfilled and where we would have paid landfill tax. Now it is being, it is taken to the energy for waste um, facility. And, and we don't pay that additional tax and we pay a lower gate fee in respect to that. That, that, that is the, the focus point, which is managing the waste as a resource. That's the, that's the sanity element where the, Recycling rate is a vanity element. It's something we want to aspirate, is the aspiration to get to that, that rate. However, in terms of managing both environmentally and financially well, the, the focus should be on diversion from landfill. That diversion from landfill, we are exceeding expectations and we have been delivering very well. Okay. Thank you. And um, uh, does that answer your question, both of you, David and Anthony? Uh, it's the same answer we get. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, yeah, criticise yeah. officers because it was a political decision to start tweeting years and years ago about uh, how the Labour administration were going to hit 50%. Uh, but the facts are, in 128 months in a row, this council has missed its recycling targets. And I agree with Councillor Fairclough um, that you need to think about having targets which are honest to yourselves uh, rather than just keep tweeting out what your aspirations are because there does come to a stage after about a decade uh, that you really do need to hit some targets. Um, in terms of incineration, um, yes, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, this council uh, incinerates anything that used to go to landfill. Uh, one of the big concerns, and it's been brought up by all four boroughs, is the fact that uh, the incinerator it has a permit to increase its incineration, uh, but uh, none of that's going to be Merton's. Uh, so I think um, there needs to be a longer term debate on incineration in areas uh, like Mitcham, which uh, can be affected by uh, mm. 
uh, pollution. No, thank you very much, David. Okay, um, if we move on to the last item, work program, is there anything uh, else we want to add to this? Um, Rosie, is there any update on um, sort of the, the work program moving forward for 21-22 that you would want to share? Uh, sorry, Chair, do you mean with regards to the topic suggestion? That's correct, yes. Okay, um, the communications for that will be going out at the end of this month and we'll start collating uh, topic suggestions from members of the public and resident associations as well as CMT and any ideas that members would like to throw into the hat also. Um, so cool. yeah, that, we'll start sending that out at the end of this month. Um, and Usually we hold the topic workshop in June. Uh, end of May, early June, and then we can devise the work programme for the coming year. Fantastic. Well, you've all heard that. So prime residence groups and residents and, and yourselves. So thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for this evening. Thank you, officers. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, residents. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. It's been a long evening, but been really worth it. And thank you all for your contributions. Yep. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Going forward. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.